Matthew and Mike. Kurt, are you ready? All right. All right. So let's let's call this meeting to order. Um, thanks everyone for coming out. We appreciate you all coming out today. Um, we don't have anything on the uh, proclamations and recognition, so we're going to go straight into the consent agenda. All matters listed below on the consent agenda are considered under one motion and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion on those items. If discussion is desired, that item will be removed from the consent agenda and will be considered separately. Members of the public wishing to speak to an item that has been pulled off the consent agenda will be limited to three minutes for public comments. Does anyone in the commission wish to pull? Yeah, I would ask that uh, on that invoice number 291370. Are you talking about claims? Yeah, be pulled from claims for a separate vote. Okay, so we're going to pull claims entirely from the consent agenda okay. as a vote. Do you have a consent agenda item that you wish to pull? I do not. We're going to pull the whole thing or just that item? I just, need, I just need one item. No, no, I just need one item pulled from the, the claims. I don't need the whole, the whole deal. Okay, well, we can just have one vote on. Okay. I can give you the adjusted numbers for the claim. Okay. What minus that invoice when you read that. Okay, that would be great. You can read the adjusted numbers then. Okay. Okay, hold on a second because yeah, we're wait, not quite wait. there yet. Thank you, though, because I'd hate to have to sit up here and do math. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so is there an item that a member of the public wishes to remove from consent agenda? Okay, so hearing none, and with the addition of claims in the amount of... $173,187.81 to 224 vendors. Thank you, Sherry. I'll entertain that motion. <clears throat> Second. Motion made by Commissioner Amick, seconded by Commissioner Larson. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. All right, now we're going to discuss this particular item. Yeah, and I so just needed to pull it for the purpose of recusing myself. Um, the particular item involves uh, payment for a cons temporary construction easement on property that I own. So I'm going to recuse myself from, from that vote. Does that mean you have to leave the room? I'm going to. <laughs> <laughs> so while he's we can back, talk about so it now. So while he's back there, should we defer it for a few weeks? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure we have enough information. <laughs> I'd, make, I'd make a motion that we approve the claim for um, that particular property involved. Here's Commissioner the Herbert. numbers if you need to read them off. That's it. Yeah. Okay. The amount of $1,000. Who would like to second that? Second. Oops. All right. Yeah. Motion made by Commissioner Amick, seconded by Commissioner Larson. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. It's deferred indefinitely is what I'm going to tell him. And Matthew said no. It's deferred indefinitely. Commissioner <laughs> 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 Amix is coming off the commission soon. You're getting you're getting silly in your you. in your last weeks. I kind of like it. All right, so now we're going to be on to general public comment. So let me. There's another paragraph I'm going to read for us. I just kind of skipped it. The public is allowed to speak to any items or issues that are not scheduled on the agenda after first being recognized by the mayor. Each person will be limited to three minutes for public comment. As a general practice, the commission will not discuss debate these items, nor will the commission make decisions on items presenting during this time. Rather, they will refer the items to staff for follow-up if necessary. Individuals are asked to come to the microphone, sign in, state their name and address. Speakers should address all comments, questions to the commission. So, does anyone have general public comment? for items that are not on the agenda. And this includes our upcoming study session items. All right, so hearing none, we'll, we'll close public comment. Um, since this is a study session, we do something a little different. We're gonna officially adjourn after going through a couple more um, items. And then we'll open our study session because during the study session, we do not actually do any voting. So it's just for discussion purposes only. But we do have public comment for those items. So um, we're on to commission items. Does anyone have an item? Okay, so city manager's report, we have none. And the calendar, does anyone have another item for the calendar? <coughs> Not 
see anything. I don't know. Good. Okay, so I'll entertain a motion to officially adjourn. So moved. Second. Motion made by Vice Mayor Bully, seconded by Commissioner Herbert. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. All right, so now we are on to our official study <coughs> session. That might have been a record, I think. Yeah. All right, so the work session provides an opportunity for the City Commission to discuss items in greater detail. As a general practice, the Commission will not make decisions on items presented during this time. Rather, they refer the items to staff for follow-up if necessary. Public comment related to the work session topics will be allowed at the end of the discussion on each item. Each person will be limited to three minutes for public comment. And we do have a shot clock over here for people to follow along. So first up, we have a brief update on the downtown master plan, a strategic plan initiative. Good evening, Mayor and Commission. Scott McCullough with Planning and Development Services standing before you to provide that brief update on a priority initiative of the city's recently adopted strategic plan for creating a downtown master plan. The desire is to create a sustainable plan that recognizes the existing successful nature of downtown and enhances downtown by incorporating innovative and creative initiatives through intensive, I wanna stress that word, intensive stakeholder and community input. To reach this end, the city manager has convened a staff committee spanning several departments to generate a draft scope of services for the plan that would be brought to the commission in January of 2018 for adoption of that scope. The plan will explore all elements of a master plan, including but not limited to land use relationships, opportunities for development and redevelopment, programming of public space, landscaping, transportation, infrastructure, and streetscape, with a heavy emphasis on cultural and historic resource activities. We envision the plan taking sort of three different phases. One is uh, upon getting a consultant on board, uh, of which we have some money budgeted through the CIP, that the consultant would, would do a pretty intensive community outreach and public participation to refine the scope define plan boundaries, sort of all the elements that, that will get us going with it. The second phase would be um, focused on building the plan and receiving, going through a couple of rounds of community input and review of that plan, and then finally adoption and um, coming before the city commission with that plan for approval. So again, we hope to kick this off in January of 2018. It would uh, consume the majority of 2018 for several departments <coughs> of the city and our resources. And with that, I would stand for questions. Any questions for Scott? I'm looking forward to it. This is we are too. I think this will, this will basically segues right into what we're talking about tonight. Okay. So it works out well. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Scott. Did you have another question? No, I was just wondering if this is related to the effort to uh, establish some uh, routes for the Lawrence Loop through the area. It, it, it's certainly interconnected, but there are two different planning studies, and the loop plan, I think, was, was begun even before this became a, a priority initiative of the strategic plan. One will certainly inform the other through the process. This process will begin, like, right after January 1st, then, or will it be on the agenda fairly quickly to start the process? Yeah, it will start with the next steps would be to present the draft RFP to the commission, get, get your approval to release that RFP, and then we would go through that process of selecting a consultant, uh, again, with your approval of that consultant ultimately, and then the consultant would guide the process from that point forward. So January would be uh, an important month to kick it off. Any other questions? Okay, let's do public comment. Thank you, Mayor. Is there any public comment on this item, the downtown master plan that we're gonna have an RFP, RFP for? Dan Dannenberg, 2702 University Drive. 
<clears throat> from my perspective, the last thing we need is to hire a, another consultant. It seems like every time we have an issue or problem, we have to hire a consultant. When it comes to downtown, we spend $50,000 subsidizing Downtown Association, Inc. And if we're going to spend money for that consultant, then that $50,000 should be contributed to that consultant. Uh, downtown Lawrence, Inc. Uh, doesn't want to hear from the public. I've tried, and they, meh, 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 meh. You know, they're kind of like the chamber. They all hide out in their little, little elite cubby holes. And any strategic plan needs to include some way to keep the downtown free of trash and to provide some kind of services for homeless and transients other than sitting around on downtown sidewalks occupying benches asking for money. Now you don't think that's a problem. Uh, it is. And if it's your objective to turn Massachusetts Street into the 16th Street Mall in Denver, then you're well on your way to doing that. But I think any kind of uh, uh, business on, on downtown strategic planning needs to include uh, some way <clears throat> to keep the, uh, the streets free of litter. There, there are leaves all over the place downtown. No one cleans up anything. When it snows, it's, uh, you, you, you make bets on who will shovel the sidewalk and who won't shovel the sidewalk. And most often, it's not shoveled because people don't want to go out there. They say, well, it's a city, city property. Well, the city doesn't have time or money for anything like that. Just like a city doesn't have time or money to keep tree limbs uh, from obstructing sidewalks. So any kind of a strategic plan needs to include this, and we don't need a consultant. Now, there's enough people around this town who can offer expertise and comment to, uh, to uh, do a strategic plan, and to spend money on a consultant is, is, is to me, a waste. Uh, and that's all we do is, it seems like, as I said before, whenever we have something come up, all we do is, well, let's hire a consultant. Well, we've hired too many consultants and we don't need to spend money for a consultant on this. Thank you, Dan. Any other public comment? Okay, Scott, does the RFP, or I guess does the projected plan include discussion of transients or? Well, I, I think that's to be determined through this uh, public participation refinement of the scope. Um, this is a pretty large undertaking with a lot of complex issues and we didn't want to, we, our proposal to the commission is that we leave it uh, loosely defined in terms of the scope and let the public really engage on um, what important to the um, all the stakeholders are the all the, the neighborhoods surrounding downtown and in downtown and let's hear from folks before we define it to the final point how will we determine the scope will they be, will there be public participation to determine the scope well we will present a, like I said a, a framework of a scope that we have to provide in the RFP to consultants so that they know what the plan needs to entail loosely but one of, the, one of the scope elements will likely be to work with the public and refine that scope, again, based on a number of issues that we could hear. Um, even in our staff committee, if you ask each of us what, what's important in downtown master planning, you get about eight or ten different answers, depending on what, you know, what seat you sit at. So we think there's going to be, again, a lot of different issues brought to the table through the process. Thank you. Sure, could I ask Scott a question? Sure. Scott, when I look at the uh, uh, group that's been assembled, the city staff that's going to put together that scope and the timeline for the RFP, I was a little bit surprised that we, you know, to help def 
to develop the RFP uh, that we didn't go outside and uh, and bring in like you know maybe a retailer from downtown and and, and other people. It's a little bit surprised uh, that we aren't using somebody from Michael and his group with Explore Lawrence because of the tourism and entertainment that goes on in downtown. Mm -hmm. hey, Commissioner, that, that's an alternative if if you direct as much um, again because. We're trying to build in that refinement of the scope after the fact. Okay. All of those groups would get a, a seat at the table at that point. Okay. No, that that's fine. I just wanted to make sure that we weren't forgetting yeah, we, anybody. We had talked about that and where do you stop was kind of our answer because we can because of downtown, because it is downtown, that list can grow very long very quickly. Okay. Any other public comment? And, and Mayor, I would add that when the RFP is brought back to the commission, there will also be opportunity to provide input at that time as well. Okay. Dan, you got to come to that meeting, provide input. Any other public comment? Okay. So we're on to number two, unless there was any other further commission discussion on that item. <clears throat> Presentation by development team on proposed 7th of New Hampshire mixed use grocery store project and downtown conference center. So we have a presentation. It looks like Mr. Paul Davis. I'm always starstruck when I see you. Hopefully you will still be starstruck after our presentation here. <laughs> um, thank you, Mayor and uh, members of the Commission. I am Paul Davis uh, with the law firm of Fagan, Emerton Davis, and I am here on behalf of the uh, development group um, that is working on the 600 block of Massachusetts and New Hampshire and also uh, the grocery store project uh, that is at 7th and New Hampshire. And the city staff has asked us to kind of combine these two issues uh, this evening, and so we're going to uh, make an effort to, to do that. And uh, what I want to do is just uh, make a few introductions and try to, to uh, start this off. Uh, we have some people that are here uh, with us this evening to, uh, to make these presentations. Uh, Mike Trainer, uh, who I think most of you are familiar with, uh, Trainer Architects, uh, is the, the lead of, uh, of our group. Uh, Bill Fleming, who is general counsel with Trainer uh, HL, is uh, uh, here as well. Uh, he's going to talk about some of the financial aspects uh, uh, related to the grocery store. And then uh, when we talk about the redevelopment project, uh, Bill Kruger is here with uh, Convention Sports and Leisure. Uh, Bill has uh, a history of uh, with this topic in Lawrence. Uh, you, the city, originally hired him a number of years ago to conduct a study uh, related to uh, the possible location of a conference center uh, over towards the, the west campus of the university. And uh, he completed that study, uh, reported back to the city, and then was engaged uh, by uh, Mike Trainer and the Simons family to uh, conduct a follow-up to that study uh, that was to study the feasibility of a conference center downtown. Uh, Bill is, is, has worked in 48 states. Uh, he is uh, among uh, a very noted group of experts uh, in uh, the topic of convention and conference centers, and I think that you'll find uh, that his, his comments will, will be a great resource to you. We really, uh, these two projects, uh, I think, are very exciting developments, uh, not just for downtown Lawrence, but uh, for our community as a whole. And uh, we're going to get into the weeds a little bit uh, with the grocery store project because uh, that's obviously uh, down the tracks a little ways, and uh, there have been some substantive conversations that have been going on uh, between city staff and some other uh, uh, of the commissions that you have here. Um, and, uh, but I'm, I'm going to focus, I guess, more of my comments uh, towards the, the redevelopment of the 600 block. Uh, the grocery store obviously is uh, 
would be taking the place of a building that is vacant right now, uh, that really doesn't have any use except for some occasional seasonal uses, uh, and is you know becoming sort of somewhat of a blighted property, and so it, it presents an opportunity to uh, put something very meaningful uh, in a in a place where there is nothing right now. Uh, it also presents an opportunity to have more people living downtown. Uh, there's 72 apartments that are slated for this project. Uh, and not to mention the fact that uh, it addresses uh, a very substantial need in our community as we have a, a food desert uh, that literally affects 24,000 people that live uh, in Lawrence, uh, 10,000 of which uh, are deemed uh, low income by the food desert standards. Uh, it'll provide a payroll, annual payroll of $2.75 million and provide 125 jobs. Uh, I think most people, people in town agree that uh, this is something that uh, has, we've been waiting for for a long time and, and I think it's going to be a very uh, great addition to downtown and to the community as a whole. Uh, let me shift then to the, to the discussion about uh, the redevelopment of the 600 block. This is really a unique opportunity for Lawrence, and in many ways it's kind of an, a once-in-a-generation opportunity. Uh, this is an overhead view of downtown, which uh, you probably can't see very uh, well from uh, this distance, but uh, we all know that uh, there's a lot of density to downtown, and uh, whenever you have an opportunity uh, with a footprint this size, uh, it's unique, and it, it is, uh, I think, once-in-a-generation. What, um, what we want to do this evening is just really kind of present something to you conceptually. And uh, we've had a number of conversations uh, with city staff, and, uh, and I think there's going to be a, a great deal of more conversations that need to take place and, and more study that's going to take place. But we're hopeful uh, that uh, this is an opportunity for you to get better acquainted uh, with uh, what we think is uh, a a good opportunity for, for downtown and uh, for you to, to formulate those questions and formulate the, the issues that you think uh, we're going to need to talk about uh, uh, further on down the road. Uh, the conference center opportunity here uh, really fits, I think, nicely within uh, goals that the city has to become a, a great tourist destination. Uh, you know. I, like many of you, have traveled to many other downtowns around the country, and I've yet to find a downtown that's better than ours. Uh, we really have something that, that, is, that is quite unique here. And uh, there are a lot of retailers, though, downtown uh, that, you know, are not doing as well as they'd like to be. And I think there's a perception oftentimes that, uh, uh, that folks downtown are, are doing really well. And that's not often the case. Uh, you know, the real retail sector all across the country is changing in, in many, many different ways. Uh, you know, if you're the Raven, uh, you know that many more people are buying books off of Amazon and, and other places. Uh, if you're Spectators or uh, another clothing store downtown, more and more people are buying clothes over the internet. And so it's, it's getting harder and harder to be in the retail sector. Uh, but uh, we're fortunate that we have uh, a unique downtown, and this, I think, gives us an opportunity to, to make downtown even better and to help uh, a lot of the retailers that are struggling with the national trends that, frankly, are probably just going to continue. Uh, and I think if we decide that uh, uh, we're not going to try to do what we can to help our downtown retailers, uh, we're going to be in a situation maybe years down the road where our downtown looks like some other downtowns in our region uh, with a lot of boarded up windows and uh, vacant buildings and uh, that's something that we rarely had downtown and we don't want to see any more of that. Uh, Bill Kruger is going to talk about the projections that his study have for the number of visitors that this could bring to Lawrence and the economic impact is, is significant. We're talking about 100,000 people coming to Lawrence on an annual basis uh, that wouldn't be coming here normally. And, you know, you look at uh, KU game days, uh, you know, days when we had lots of people coming to football games and the economic impact that that has on downtown. Uh, and 
you know, you can add up the number of these visitors and see uh, what, what the impact of that can be. What we want to see is, is, is a partnership with the city. And, uh, you know, and I don't think that any of us have an answer to exactly how that looks right now, uh, but we think that this is a significant enough project here downtown where uh, the city needs to be, uh, you know, right there at the center of the table. Uh, we've had discussions with the university about uh, this project. Uh, the university uh, thinks that this could be a, a very good project for the community, uh, could have benefits to the university, and, and they want to be part of this discussion as well. And uh, if we're going to do something uh, that's really meaningful, that has a community benefit, uh, obviously the, the city has to be uh, right there at the forefront. And uh, you know, we're here tonight. To, to say to you, you know, we, we want to be your partner, we want to work with you uh, to make this the best project uh, that it can be and to have something that has a real community benefit. The Simons family has owned uh, this piece of property for, for many generations and uh, they will tell you that it's important to them uh, to see this piece of land have a real benefit for the community. Uh, one of the reasons that they decided that they wanted to sell this piece of property uh, to Mike Trainer is because Mike was committed to doing something that was going to have a real community benefit. And when he talks uh, to you here shortly, uh, he's going to talk exactly uh, about what he sees the community benefit uh, to be. Uh, we can bring more people to Lawrence, we can help businesses, we can help grow downtown. And we're also going to have uh, a gathering place, uh, something that downtown Lawrence has really needed for a long time. Uh, they get the plaza footprint in, in the drawings that you have seen here uh, is roughly the size of the Power and Light District in Kansas City. So if you've been over there, you get a, a good idea for, for how big that is. And it's a great opportunity for movies, uh, watching KU games, uh, just community gatherings of, of all uh, sorts and sizes. This is a mixed-use project. Uh, it, it involves a hotel that would be about 140 rooms. It would bring the number of hotel rooms downtown to over 400 rooms, uh, which is uh, what Bill Kruger will talk about is important if you're going to be able to kind of attract the kind of conferences that we want to attract. Uh, it would include owner-owned condominiums. Uh, these would be much like the Hobbs-Taylor projects where uh, these were condos that are owned by people uh, and it's uh, going to add a, a more of a mixed population uh, downtown, which I think is something that uh, everybody is interested in having. Uh, more apartments as, as well to help uh, bring more people downtown. Uh, and as I discussed, uh, the, the plaza, the gathering space, uh, a great community space that we can have. Uh, one of the things, one of the people that we were hoping to have here tonight uh, was Lyle Butler with the Manhattan Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Lyle, I've actually known Lyle for a number of years and uh, he is truly one of the well, most well respected people in, in economic development uh, around the state of Kansas and Lyle has played uh, an instrumental role in what has happened to the downtown revitalization in, in Manhattan. And uh, we were uh, hoping to have him here to talk about that and to talk about the conference center uh, that they built in downtown Manhattan. As a matter of fact, Manhattan is looking at expanding their conference center because it has been successful and uh, their city commission is meeting right now and he has to be there for that. But we did bring uh, a presentation from, uh, from Lyle about what's going on with the Manhattan Conference Center. And I think it's uh, very instructive uh, uh, for you to, to take a look at. And this conference center opened back in 2013. And so far, it's had over 167,000 visitors. It's had an, a $30 million economic impact in Manhattan. 85% uh, of the days of the year, are they have meetings there. And, uh, and if you look at when those meetings are, they're during the week. Uh, and one of the most interesting slides to look at, uh, which is on page 17, will demonstrate to you, um, if you look and see 
at occupancy during the week. I mean, one of the, one you can of put that on the Elmo so that people in the audience can see. Someone might have to help you. I'm pretty sure you don't have enough of these for the whole audience. To we do us. not. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Diane. There are many people in the hotel industry will uh, tell you that that's not what things usually look like, and especially in the hotels that are here in town right now. They're mostly occupied during on the weekends, and uh, the conference center gives you an opportunity to really increase your occupancy days uh, during the week. And uh, you know that's the that's the low time for for retailers. It's a low time for restaurants. Uh, so this is you know, more people who are in hotels, more people who are at restaurants, more people who are out uh, spending money during the week. Uh, one other thing I want you to know about uh, the Manhattan Conference Center is that Kansas State University uh, has really not had a a substantial role or, or had really no role in the inception of this. Um, and I think that there may be a common belief out there that you need to have the university involved in some manner in order for something to be successful. But uh, Kansas State University uh, has, you know, while they certainly use this facility from time to time, and I think it's getting increased interest there, uh, they, have, they were not a participant uh, from, from the start. So, I mean, we're encouraged that KU, uh, as we start through this process, is wants to be a part of the discussion and uh, a part of this. Uh, lastly, I want to just uh, talk about, I think, you know, where we want to go from here and uh, the next steps. I think there's been some discussion in the newspaper and there's certainly been discussion around about, um, you know, this, what, what role would the city have in a conference center? And what we really, we don't have definite ideas for that. Uh, the city being a participant in the conference center in some way, shape, or form, and I think there's a lot of different ways that this can happen, uh, is beneficial for a number of different reasons, uh, financial reasons, uh, investment reasons. Uh, but, you know, we want to just have a dialogue with you about um, your interest in that and, um, and whether there is, is the ability for, for a you know, public partner public-private partnership in that. But what we want to make very clear is, is that um, we do not envision any scenario whereby we are going to ask the city to take on risk with this conference center. Uh, we are prepared to take on the risk of, of the conference center. And uh, you as elected officials have to be able to face the public and say, if we're going forward on something like this, um, you know, we don't want to be getting you into a situation that the city is going to have to feed on down the road. And there are examples out there where that is occurring. Just go over to Overland Park and, and that's happening year in and year out. Uh, we do not want Lawrence, Kansas to get into that situation and we are not asking uh, that we get into that situation. Uh, what, we're, what we're asking t uh, you to do is, is to, to say that this is something that is an important project for the city. We want to make sure that we get it right. We want to make sure that we're going to have a community benefit to it. And so we want to have a dialogue uh, with the people who own this property and want to redevelop this property. Uh, we also have to keep in mind that something has to happen to this property. Um, I know that. Mike is going to tell you that you know, he, his plan is not to just sit on this for five or <clears> ten <throat> years. And I don't think anybody wants that to happen uh, because uh, a big building that's just sitting there isn't doing anybody any good at all. Uh, we want to move forward on something and, and we want to develop something and we want to work with you as, as we do that. So uh, we appreciate uh, the opportunity to have this presentation tonight and I now want to just ask Mike to come up and uh, he can walk you through some of the, the specifics about where the grocery store discussion is right now and talk about some of the specifics of uh, our preliminary plans with the, the redevelopment of the 600 block. I got one quick question, Paul. Yeah. Yes. You indicated that KU is now expressing interest in being uh, part of this project, is that correct? Yes. Are they willing to bring money to the table? 
that I don't know. I, I don't think that um, right now they are, have really entertained a discussion about whether they want to uh, put any kind of resources okay. into that. Uh, but uh, uh, but they're, they're just in, they're interested in being part of the dialogue okay. right now. Thank you. I have a question as well. The uh, Manhattan <clears throat> Conference Center, would, do you see that as a comp for what Lawrence would build? Uh, yes. Okay, and, and, and on that note, you know, I, I haven't had a chance to go through this, obviously we just received it, but just at a, at a glance, you know, I note that in conversations I've had surrounding the conference center, the number that keeps coming up is 100,000 visitors a year. Uh, but the numbers for Manhattan don't seem to bear that anywhere near. Uh, I mean, they're averaging 42,000 a year. Right, what would it be about Lawrence that would enable us to, to more than double what Manhattan is producing? Well. I, I'm, I'm going to let Bill, I, Bill Kruger can give you a much more precise answer than, okay. than, than I can. I think it is, a, it is comparable in that, um, you know, this is a university community. Um, I think Manhattan probably has about half the population that Lawrence does. I don't know if that's, that's correct or, or not, but uh, it's been growing a lot, certainly. Uh, and, and I think we have some, you know, very similar uh, circumstances there. Uh, we would see a, a conference center that's going to be larger uh, and is going to be able to accommodate uh, more people and larger conferences. Uh, but, you know, I mean, we also have, um, you know, I grew up here in Lawrence, as many of you did, and we always have liked to think we're a little better than Manhattan. <laughs> but I think Manhattan, you know, but, it, but I think we are a larger community here. And, uh, and I think we have a downtown uh, that is, you know, uh, that has many more amenities uh, than Manhattan's downtown has uh, right now. And so, uh, you know, Bill, I think, can go into some more details as to uh, what he looked at to justify uh, those projections. Okay. The other question I'd ask you with regards to the Manhattan comparison is, um, I'm frankly kind of surprised to hear Manhattan having the conversation about expanding their conference center when the numbers seem to bear out that every single year since it's been built they've had declining attendance um, and I didn't know if you had a response as to what you know what is is that the market speaking to a demand for conference center space or is that just Manhattan not you know able to keep up with what, what the original hype or what's going on right. there well once again Bill will do a better okay. job of being able to address that but uh, we had that very specific conversation with Lyle Butler, and I asked him that question uh, because if you look at it, it's, you see yeah, it's a pretty some, significant some drop from last year, in fact. And and uh, they have they have spent a lot of time looking at that, and I think what what Bill will tell you is is that any time you build one of these, you have a honeymoon period uh, where uh, there's kind of the, an ex uh, you have a lot of initial uh, uh, conferences that that, and then you sort of settle into. Uh, uh, a steady business so that, they, that you hope is going to be there. I mean, Manhattan feels pretty confident that they are, they've now gone through that honeymoon period and uh, they're at a leveling out point. Uh, they have also looked at, uh, there have been an addition of, the, the, the loss in, in conferences that they have seen is, is mainly in the wedding business and there evidently have been the addition of numerous wedding venues in Manhattan, and that is to account uh, for some of that. But I think Bill will do, be able to better address those points. I wanted to ask procedurally, um, in the beginning this was going to be mostly about the grocery store, and I want to kind of understand what percentage of conversation do you see being dedicated to the grocery store versus the conference center? Because I would hate to see the conference center perhaps kind of take the majority of it when we have all of our information is about the grocery store? Well, we certainly, I have to, uh, my, my understanding of, of this is, uh, I think, probably uh, a different one than yours because mm -hmm. in the beginning, this was supposed to be a study session about uh, the redevelopment of the 600 block and then the city staff asked us to uh, include the grocery store discussion. Oh, I see. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think that, you know, Mike is going to spend most of his time talking about the grocery store. Okay. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we, we want to try to do equal justice, I guess, to both of these. And, and in the end, uh, you know, you, you all decide what you want us to talk about uh, and what your 
where your questions are, and we'll we'll try to focus our yeah. energies. In that I do direction. want to ask the commission: Is there any kind of minor, minority majority amount of time that you want to spend on the grocery store versus the conference center? Do you have any opinion mm -hmm. as to how you want that to be divided? Let me go ahead and proceed with their um, uh, presentation, and I'm sure that we'll direct where uh, that discussion is going to go. Okay. Okay. Is that acceptable to the rest of the commission? Okay. Thank you. Yeah, and I do hope you you know Bill Kruger is here. He's come in from Chicago. He's got a lot of history here, and I think he you will find it to be a really great resource. And I hope uh, you, you have a good amount of time to be able to sure. to ask questions of, of him because uh, he, he's an expert in this area. And I also might just say you know he he's not our hired gun. Um, we, we just ask him to come in because uh, of his history with this mm -hmm. and uh, you know he was originally hired by you um, so I mean he's really your expert in many ways thank you Paul all right thank you Mary. Mm -hmm. do you know how to switch back to the Diane's gotcha no idea <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Diane. Diane, how? Okay. Thank you. Well, thanks, everybody. Thanks for having us down here and hosting this. Um, we're excited to give you the background, a, a lot of detail on the grocery store. The grocery store is what we see as our next project uh, as far as uh, co completing the development uh, in this block and the 600 block. The 600 block, we wanted to give you a general idea of a possible plan. Um, we think that that's going to take a lot more um, of your participation, participation plus you know downtown participation, DLI participation, people that are stakeholders in that project. It's just beginning, um, but you know we're going to show you a concept anyway for the development of that site, and then we'll spend quite a bit of time talking about the grocery store, the specifics on that, um, and then in the end, all of that is going to um, culminate with a request for a TIF uh, to pay for the parking that is contemplated to be built underneath the grocery store, adding approximately 330 new parking spaces in downtown. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to talk a little bit about um, our past experience downtown. The drawing uh, up here on the wall is, um, shows a lot of properties that we're involved with, but um, in particular, our building at uh, 1040 Vermont uh, that's for Trainer HL is our headquarters. Um, as you all may know, we have um, about 60 people there. The, we chose Lawrence as the headquarters for Trainer. Um, we have offices you know, across the country from San Francisco, Denver, uh, Dallas, Atlanta. And we have about 160 people. The, um, one of the things that attracts us downtown is, you know, the vibrancy and the, you know, the, the food and the, and the walkability and, you know, we took a vote in the office and, you know, it was overwhelmingly people wanted to go downtown versus having a suburban site. But critical for us was being able to park the people that work in our, our business and we were able to work with the city to um, make half of the north lot, the lot north of our uh, building as a 10 hour lot. Um, as as was the parking spaces along the street and then the parking spaces at the community building. If we, if we weren't able to solve the parking issues, um, it wouldn't be attractive to us to move downtown and we probably would not have done that. And we would have been in a suburban location. So all this is about parking. <clears throat> our next project, um, or our next projects were all clustered around 9th and New Hampshire. You're all familiar with the buildings. We've been down here and talked about them several times. The first project was the 901 building. It's uh, one level of mixed use on the first floor, office building on the second floor, and then five floors of apartments above. Am I, am I loud enough here? Kurt, is that coming across okay? Okay. Um, <clears throat> so it has 55 units above the second floor. Um, we built that next to the existing garage, so we did not ask for any help with parking. The parking was built by with a uh, general obligation bond that the city uh, issued at the time, about $10 million, 500 spaces. 
Uh, it's perfect for us. The, it was envisioned at the time that uh, a building would be built on the site of the 901 building in addition to the other end of the block and that the taxes from those properties that the increase in value on those properties would go towards re, go towards the city but the idea was that it was retiring the debt on uh, that parking structure. Across the street we built the Marriott Hotel. Um, Chuck Mackey uh, who runs our Marriott Hotel and also has quite a bit ex of experience with um, the conference center and he has a conference center in, in Briarcliff is here tonight. Um, he runs capital management which owns uh, this hotel. They also developed the Spring Hill Suites on the riverfront at the time. Just a little background, but we we built a hundred parking spaces under the hotel. The, um, the the developer provided the equity, uh, borrowed the money from the bank to build the building or build the parking, and um, is had requested a TIF in order to pay for those parking spaces. That's in lieu of any other kind of park, public parking that would be available. You know, we didn't have the same kind of thing that we had with the 901 building. The, uh, just to the north of that is the 888 building, it's an apartment building. Um, you know, it, it, it meets some of the requirements or some of the uh, initiatives of the city, and then that it creates density for downtown. Um, we do have a parking garage underneath that building, and again, that parking garage is retired with a rebate of taxes, property taxes, that pays uh, the debt service on that. Again, the developer borrowed the money, uh, built the structure, and is simply uh, being repaid over a 20-year time period. It looks like the hotel will actually pay off in about 12 years, and then uh, all of those taxes will then go to a general fund. <clears throat> um, so moving down the street, the most recent building is our 800 New Hampshire. Uh, 55 units built on top of the Pachamamas building, which if anybody ever thinks of building on top of the Pachamamas building, <laughs> it's very difficult. But um, we didn't provide any parking in that location except for a few spaces along the south side. Uh, it has a large public parking lot next to it, has a 10-hour lot on the east side of, uh, west side of Rhode Island, east side of the city lot there. Um, so it's a little bit of an experiment. We're going to put more demand on that on that parking lot. Um, you know, th in the future, that might be a great location for an, another garage. Um, and then we get to our project. So how does it, this? Next slide. I was curious what all the yellow properties were before you go to the next one. There's quite a few kind of scattered here and there. Those are buildings that we have um, a economic interest in. Oh, the sandbar isn't yellow though. I thought. No, it's not ours. Oh, okay. Um, so this slide shows both the conference center. The very. I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes on the conference center. Very general plan trying to get the elements that we think are important on that site. But um, it would have a mixture of apartments, uh, condominiums, so we could have ownership of units downtown for the first time in our projects. Um, we have a taller building, the 12-story condominium project, mixed use along uh, Massachusetts Street, which would have four to five stories of apartments above retail has a 140 room hotel and then a 35,000 square foot conference center. Has a large plaza in the center of it. Um, you heard Paul talk about that as being about the same size as the power and light. So a very significant public space. <clears throat> and then just up the street is the, uh, the large yellow block is our proposed grocery store. Uh, an image of the grocery store here. So uh, obviously the project is located on the north half of the 7 to 800 block of New Hampshire Street and Rhode Island Street. Um, while we're on this slide, I want to point out that 
the city owns approximately 58 spaces that are located on the Hobbs-Taylor site. Part of the deal with the Hobbs-Taylor people is that we are proposing that the city relocate those parking spaces onto our property where we would have 330 uh, public parking spaces. Um, <clears throat> so the, the, those spaces would then go to Hobbs-Taylor. There would be really not much difference in what the use is from what it is today to what it would be after that transfer. It's basically used by the commercial tenants in Hobbs-Taylor. They would continue to be used by the commercial tenants in Hobbs-Taylor. It's a 43,000 square foot grocery store. <clears throat> As you've heard, it is located within a, a 10 square mile USDA designated food desert. We have 72 apartments above the grocery store, which front onto, mostly onto uh, New Hampshire Street. And then part of that is with the city's new policy that 11 would be affordable uh, housing units. Clicking. Floor plan of the grocery store uh, at the north half of the uh, lot between Rhode Island Street and New Hampshire Street, as you can see. Um, it's full service grocery store. Lots of fresh fruits, vegetables. Um, what you'll see is as soon as you enter the building. Um, it has a large delicatessen and prepared foods area. Then it has um, a large area, you can see in the center here, of regular groceries. It is an urban store. It's built above a, a parking garage. Um, when you first go to the store, you're going to learn that you'll turn into the parking garage on the north side, off 7th Street ramp down and then you'll be able to find your parking space and go up in the building either an elevator or there's an escalator. Um, it's similar to an urban store in Kansas City's Constantino's which has the same kind of access to a parking garage. Um, the entrance is on the southwest corner. The property, it's built to the property lines to the north, almost to the property lines on the west and then where you see the parking is, is on the south side. We're 20 feet off the Rhode Island uh, uh, property line. That was an accommodation to uh, try to satisfy the neighbors that, that uh, they're concerned with an imposing structure coming towards, all the way towards Rhode Island Street. There's two levels of parking below, which I'll get into that a little bit later. Two or one floor uh, that goes all the way around, so we've got two stories on the back side, <clears throat> uh, where you see there on the right, that would be two and one stories, and then four stories along New Hampshire Street. You can see there on the elevation that it's two stories on the back. And here you can see on the bottom image is where it is stepped down along New Hampshire to one and two stories. Much more residential in scale. Um, this will be going to the historic resources here before too long. We are showing uh, the livery building is gone in this image. Um, that's up to historic resources, whether they want that or not, we're prepared for either way. And obviously central to all this is the parking. Um, the demand analysis that the city has prepared um, has that we would need 332 spaces. Um, we have a total demand of 332 and a total supply of 337. That's um, broken down for the residential, it's 116 the retail, 149. Um, and I might note that those are based on what our planning documents are now, which 
makes suburban grocery stores and urban grocery stores the same. Uh, we think that there's some discussion that needs to be had on that, but uh, same thing with the residential. It's the number of apartments that out in the west side of town would be the same number of parking spaces that would be required downtown. We know from our own experience that not everyone has a car, and most have one at, at most. So um, people are walking to work. They're you know, actually living as an urban experience. Um, <clears throat> this just is a little bit of detail. This is the Hobbs Taylor building. The pink are the spaces that we are um, proposing to trade uh, the city spaces for city spaces in our lot. This shows the yellow we would propose would be one hour parking that would be able, accessible to the grocery store. Uh, it's trying to keep people from parking there for more than an hour while they're shopping. The green would be two-hour parking along the street. That would be new angled parking to match what's at, there at Hobbs Taylor. And then we have a bus stop on the north side of the building. Lower level, <clears throat> again, yellow would be the one-hour parking. That would be servicing the grocery store up above. The pink is long-term parking. And pink here is all long-term parking. It would all be public parking. Um, the apartment residents would need to buy a pass for the year. Anybody else that would want to get a pass for the year would also buy one. Then it would be a hunt and peck for a uh, parking space. Um, we're gonna, I'm going to have Bill Fleming come up here in just a minute, but um, it might be that you know, perhaps the tax increment revenues would be used to defray costs on this, but there would be, perhaps we would enter into a, a, uh, a lease back to the city for the parking that would be public parking. Yes, so, please. Um, Commissioner Amix has a question for you. Sure. Real quick, uh, the ownership of the two projects, the grocery store and the co uh, conference center, are, are they the same ownership group or are they gonna be different ownership groups? Is that yet to be determined? Yet to be determined. Okay. All of our uh, projects downtown have different ownership groups. Um, we would imagine that some of our investors would all come with us on the next project, which would be the grocery store. <coughs> okay. Bill? Bill is going to take us through some of the financial aspects of doing the TIF and the, and the uh, incentives. Before Thanks for, Bill okay. comes up, that. Um, chart that you had that had the parking that was right before I'm not seeing that in the presentation can you go back to that yeah those two I'm not seeing those in here perhaps you can add them sure yeah we can add an updated one hmm. okay I don't have the best vision so I look usually on my computer rather than over there. I can read that. That was inadvertent. <laughs> it should be in there. Um, OK. I guess I'm not seeing it. Perhaps it's at the end. But we'll double check with that. Right, Diane? Yeah, it, it, they brought a presentation that was on a drive. So if there's a difference or something, we can. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. <clears throat> Uh, again, thank you for your time, and uh, we're excited to be here and, and talk about the, the project. Um, I'm just going to talk about real quickly some of the, uh, the financial aspects of the project. Um, as you know, we sent a letter to the city in August, and based on that letter, we basically requested um, a number of items in order to try to help uh, make the project work financially, and that's, that's always the challenge. Uh, in these deals, especially with parking, as we know. Um, you know, our estimated cost for a parking space, an underground parking space is around $35,000 per parking space. So they're, they're not very cheap to build. Um, Bill, before you get started. Sure. Has, I see on here it says incentive request. Has there been a formal application that's been put in yet, or is this preceding there a formal application? There has been a letter sent to the city, which you've accepted. Uh, at one of your city commission meetings, and then uh, we've form we've actually filed a formal 
you know, economic development application with the city as well as part of that. So is yeah, that one of the links that's request. in the... So. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So. Because uh, normally that would go to PERC first, wouldn't it? Yes, normally the, the process is for us to file our application and then for a consultant to be retained, which they have a consultant, he's here today. Uh, we've worked with him, we've shared financial information with him, and then the next step would be to go to PERC. Um, we've been uh, discussing uh, whether we're ready to go to PERC or not. That's been some of the discussion. Uh, and so that's, that's kind of why we're here, is to, to make this presentation and talk about. So you uh, plan on amending the application, is what it sounds like, and then PERC would see an amended application? Um, I don't know that we're going to amend the application. I think it's a matter of figuring out whether we're going to go ahead and proceed with the project before new markets tax credits are allocated to the project or afterwards. So that's part of why we're here, just have that discussion about the timing of the, the project and when it's going to proceed. Uh, this, this project, because of the, the, the financial aspects associated with the grocery store, uh, is also dependent on a federal tax credit program for support. And uh, we, you know, we have to get those allocations uh, from um, different community development entities that uh, make the allocations. Those allocation awards are going to be announced probably in January of uh, this year, um, or in 2018, I guess. And so, uh, you know, we're waiting to see uh, whether those uh, allocation awards are going to be made to the people that we've been talking to. And uh, we're pretty confident that if they're made to the people we've been talking to, that we'll get that award. But that's part of the part of the discussion that we've been having with the city about what is the, the appropriate timing uh, for moving the process forward. I guess I'm trying to understand that if the normal process is to go to PERC next, then why we would be having this discussion now, it seems a little preemptive. Is it meant to be preemptive? Um, we would just, we would be happy to go to PERC next if that would be the process that the city wanted to pursue, but uh, that's not apparently the process we're pursuing right now. So. Yeah. Are you waiting for HRC approval before you go to PERC, no, perhaps? No, it doesn't depend on that. I'm just trying to understand the intent and what you are looking to get from the commissioners today, Mayor, tonight. In my comments, I can help frame that a little bit, but we had suggested in our last discussion with the development team that it might be a good idea while they were here on the conference center item this evening to talk a little to bit discuss about the, the incentives. So you aren't actually expecting any input from the commissioners on your incentive request that's already formally been put through the process or is in process, I should say. Well, it's yeah, it's in process, but to say we wouldn't expect input. I mean, we would absolutely expect your input and your discussion and and uh, the, the, the incentives that have been requested um, um, need a lot of discussion They need a lot of work there's there's maybe some other ideas that we can pursue um, you know so I think there's a lot of discussion that needs to be had with respect to how we uh, how we how we do this and I'll, I'll get into a little bit of that detail here in a second please continue okay thank you appreciate it so this is the actual request that we've made was summarized here um, the Hobbs Taylor as Mike has alluded to they actually have a covenant that restricts uh, the size of the, the development uh, on our site. And so part of the uh, discussion we've had with Hobbs Taylor is to do kind of a, um, you know, an exchange where we would take parking spaces that are on, located on their site and move them over to our site and basically uh, make a number of parking spaces on our site um, public, public spaces. Now, the, the challenge in the deal, of course, is that we originally proposed uh, about a seven million dollar parking garage which was about a hundred and sixty roughly parking spaces underground parking spaces um, we um, have then received some feedback from Scott and from the city staff uh, that they would like to see that expanded and so what you've seen here and what's shown on this is actually a hundred and ten additional spaces and so it's a, it's a larger parking garage, so it's grown from maybe a $7 million project to about a $12 million project. Well, that's fine to do that, but 
we could probably, through a tax increment financing district, pay for $7 million, but I don't think we can pay for $12 million. So once we, if we all agree as a community that we're going to build more parking, then we have to have a discussion about how we're going to pay for it. So that's part of why we're giving you the preview <laughs> to have this discussion, is to, to have that discussion about how do we pay for that larger expanded uh, parking. Now, the parking obviously would be public. It would all benefit. Uh, everyone in the city, so there'd be a huge community advantage or community benefit to the parking, but uh, that's really kind of the challenge that we have in dealing with this thing. So um, I'm going to quickly run through this. You have the slides and you have this information and I don't need to read any of this, but basically the city has a policy that outlines uh, the appropriate use of uh, tax increment financing district. And just to summarize real quickly, everybody, I think everybody understands this, but basically the idea behind tax increment financing is that you take the additional tax revenues that are generated by the project, and that's in form of both an ad valorem property tax increase and also sales tax um, increase from the sales that are occurring on the property. Uh, and we'll get into a discussion in a little bit about that issue on sales tax, but, um, and, and you use those as essentially a form of payment for the, for, for the, to pay for the parking. And uh, the advantage, I think, to the city of that approach is, you know, it's, you're not having to use a general obligation bond uh, to pay for the parking, which is how you paid for the first, the, the parking garage that's located at 9th and New Hampshire, that was paid through with the GO bond. Uh, so it's not just the city at large cost. Uh, you're not having to pay for it through a special assessment district, which is how you pay for a portion of the parking located at the library. Uh, was through a special assessment. In fact, our property, the Borders property, has a special assessment that arises from that. Um, and so, and, and what it does then is also uh, creates tax base for all the taxing districts. So everybody essentially shares in the benefit and the burden of having that additional, uh, additional uh, ad valorem property tax used for to pay for the parking. So, so I think it's a, it's a very good tool. Um, again, it's only the property taxes that are generated by the property itself that are used. It's not uh, property taxes at large from other, other properties uh, that go to do that. Currently, the property, the board's property pays $56,000 a year in property tax, uh, even though it's sitting there vacant. Um, and so, um, you know, that obviously because it's an increment doesn't, uh, it's not affected, that $56,000 still continues to be paid to the taxing jurisdictions. So um, quickly, I don't want to waste a lot of time on these benefits, but your existing city policy outlines a number of factors that you're supposed to look at in determining whether to grant a tax increment financing district. And uh, we've just quickly summarized those and why we think that our project satisfies those. I mean, we have, we have a food desert. This is going to be uh, a way to provide for fresh vegetables, produce, food uh, within uh, walking distance of East Lawrence and uh, also provides a significant benefit for North Lawrence. Um, and uh, so I think it's going to be a significant benefit for the, for the community. Um, I think Paul alluded earlier that we have about $2.75 million in payroll. Uh, these are jobs that are going to be available to people uh, that live in this area. Uh, so there's going to be a significant impact from, uh, from the additional payroll. Um, you know, the, there are part-time jobs associated with this, but there's also a number of full-time jobs, and the full-time jobs all have, um, you know, a decent benefit package in terms of health insurance and that sort of thing. Um, strengthens the economic base. Again, I'm just going to go through these fairly quickly because I don't think uh, that we need to, to, to summarize. But basically, uh, the project, because it's infill development, meets all of the, meets the, the basic, the broad policy goals that you've outlined in your policy as to what needs to be met. So the, the, the issues and the, the concerns that we've been addressing and have discussions with the city and why I think it's having this type of discussion is still beneficial um, is one issue that's been raised is um, with respect to the loan uh, request. Well, we don't do loans or we haven't done, historically done loans to private businesses. So that, that's an issue. Uh, second issue is uh, there's a concern that the sales tax increment, the way that works is you have a sales tax of 9.05%. 2.55% of that sales tax is 
um, the city and the county share. So that's the increment that we ask for to be used to pay for the parking facilities. And um, the concern that's been raised by the city staff is that, well, what if we just, you know, we don't really tr truly generate new sales, new grocery store sales. We just simply are taking sales away from the 6th Street store Dillon's or the 19th Street store Dillon's or, you know, some other stores in the community. So there's just a reallocation of those sales. There's not really new sales that are being generated. So, th so that's been a concern that's been, been raised, and I think it's, it's a legitimate concern to, to talk about. Um, and then I think the final issue that, that is important is, is providing for adequate parking for the project and, and essentially how do we pay for that, that adequate parking. And, and there's a number of, I think, ways we can do that, but I think we have to have a dialogue and a discussion with the city about how we do that. So um, I'm going to first try to address the sales increment issue. Uh, what we've found in with our uh, 888 New Hampshire projects and our other projects is about a little over 50% of the people that are, are tenants in those buildings are actually new to Lawrence. So they haven't been in Lawrence before, so they're new people moving in. Now maybe that's because they're about half of our building in 888 is students. So it's 30% are undergraduate, 20% are graduate students. And then the rest are really uh, more young professionals, sometimes retired people. It's it, that the rest of the 50% is kind of a a collection, I guess, of different uh, demographics, but um, but we're seeing a significant number of people that are coming to downtown that want to live in these projects um, that are um, new to downtown, and so we think that um, you know building 72 units here um, that we can uh, attract more people, and I think having a downtown grocery store is going to be a significant benefit for everybody in downtown, not just for uh, our tenants. I mean, it's going to help the businesses. It's going to pull more traffic into downtown. Hopefully, people will come down and do their grocery shopping, and then maybe they'll walk across the street and go to the restaurant and eat, and maybe they'll go shop at Waxman Candles and buy a candle. I mean, we need people that are going to come to downtown and 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 shop, and so that that additional traffic, I think, is a significant benefit uh, that that is enhances downtown. Um, the other issue is that we're going to have payroll. A fairly significant payroll, and and there'll be economic uh, sales taxes, uh, other economic benefits generated by uh, by the fact that we've got people that have jobs and and are employed and and are living in downtown, and so uh, I think, you know, I guess my reaction to the argument of oh we're not going to generate a lot of new grocery store sales is yes, but we're going to generate a lot of economic activity that's all going to benefit downtown, and. I think if you look at all of the benefits of the project and you weigh those against the cost, because it's a cost-benefit analysis, it's not just the cost and it's not just the benefit, you have to weigh both of them. I think on balance, the project is, is very, very good and very, very beneficial. Now that's, that's me talking as an advocate, I'm not the one that has to make that decision, you guys have to make that decision, but um, you know, I, I, I really do believe that this is uh, as a game changer. I think that if we have a downtown grocery store, there's going to be a lot more people that are going to want to live in our downtown, and that's good for everyone. Okay. Um, we've done the financial performance. We've done the modeling. We've worked with Tom Jackson, who's the city consultant. Um, right now, um, based on the assumptions that we're using, uh, we don't have a significant gap um, in between what we want, what we think we need to collect in terms of rent and revenue and, and what it's going to cost to pay for everything. However, <laughs> there's a couple caveats to that statement. One is my assumptions in my pro forma assume that the city would make this loan for $2.25 million dollars and uh, that would be either a low interest loan or a no interest loan. So, um, you know, if that's not true, then the gap's probably $4 a square foot. And that's why that, you have that statement in the middle of that is your gap grows if the city says we're not interested in making this loan. So then, then, then we have an issue of how do, we, how do we narrow this gap. You know, the grocery store business is a tough business. Uh, our rent per square foot that we're going to charge the grocery store is about seven bucks a square foot. It's very, very low. 
anything else that we're doing in downtown Lawrence, we typically start charging out. Before we do any tenant improvement work at all, we start we charge at sixteen dollars square foot. So there's there's nine dollars difference between what we normally collect and versus what we can charge a grocery store. And part of that's just the nature of the grocery store business. It's a very high margin or high high volume, low margin business, and they just can't afford uh, to pay a lot in rent. Um, that's part of the reason that they, you know, don't typically locate in a very dense urban type of district like what we have here. You know, it's more expensive uh, to go into a downtown area, and uh, so that's part of the challenge in trying to bring a grocery store downtown is, is that difference. Um, as we talked about, the other issue um, is the parking and how to pay for the parking. Um, we can pay for 160 parking spaces roughly in the, in the, in the grocery store. Um, I did a model that says, okay, what if we add 55 paid spaces to the model? And I, I, I don't show that we pay for all of that uh, at the end of 20 years. We still have about two and a half million dollars that isn't paid for. So, um, but we can probably work with that. I mean, as long as we got most of it paid for, we're probably okay as a developer. Um, and then, uh, you know, if we add the higher Looks like yeah, yeah, I just, has I, uh, regarding your the rent per square foot, you talked about that you know the market seems to bear that you could potentially charge up to nine additional dollars per square foot on the property, and I think that brings up a, a concern throughout the community: is what what term are we talking about guaranteed that this will be maintained as a grocery store? Well, there's a uh, the grocery store operator. We have a, a letter of intent, and we've agreed to a 20-year lease term, uh, so they're liable to pay rent for 20 years. And they also have a five-year no-going dark clause in was part of that uh, agreement, which basically means even if they're losing money, they can't close the store. So the, the grocery store operator is making a very significant commitment to the community because they're going to be liable to pay rent for 20 years on that space. So. And financially, where would the city fall in terms of uh, payback liability. Let's let's say that the grocery store does does fail, goes dark, so to speak. But they're still li they're still on the hook for you for rent. That's a good question. Let me let me provide a possible solution, and then we'll come back and address that because that's a good question. Okay, so just okay. hold that question if you don't mind for just a second. Sure. All right. So um, one possible solution uh, to how do we pay for this parking? is uh, was suggested by Tom Marcus the city manager and that po that possible solution would be to what if we had a lease purchase option for the grocery store and the basic concept would be to um, have the developer build the project pay for everything up front and then the city would lease back the entire parking structure and operate it as a public parking facility and then, um, you know, to the extent that tax increment financing revenues were, were available, they would pay, you know, a, a portion of the cost of the parking garage. And then the difference would be paid in the form of a, a city rent payment on the lease purchase. And then basically at the end of 20 years, the city would own the parking facility for a dollar. I mean, the, in other words, it would be structured so that at the end of 20 years, the city would become the owner of the parking facility outright. So that's, that's a possible solution. I'm not saying it's a great idea or a bad idea. I, I think it's a possible uh, solution to, to solve the issue. But um, another idea would be uh, to form a commercial improvement district. This is not really an idea I've discussed with the city yet, uh, but uh, would be to form a commercial improvement district and then uh, take that, that equipment loan um, that we're concerned about being a loan and just create a special assessment for that and then um, be, be able to pay back uh, the assessment over, say, a 15 to 20 year period. Uh, very similar to what, you know, uh, we do all the time as a city in terms of, of infrastructure. At, you know, when, when we did the Bower Farm Development, we did a special improvement district to, to pay for right turn lane improvements and we paid that back over 10 years. So you, certainly you could do something similar to that. The commercial improvement district statute does allow you to take dollars and use those to pay to equip buildings. 
So uh, and who, who so gets that assessed that special assessment under well, a CID? Well, the property owner would get assessed that. So we, the developer, would have the assessment. And then the advantage, I think, to the city, one of the concerns about the loan idea was how do we know we're going to get paid back? Well, the special assessment becomes uh, in the nature of a real estate assessment. And so you have to pay your real estate taxes and you have to pay your special assessments. And if you don't, then the property can go be foreclosed upon by the city and the county. And so, you know, we're going to have $20 million of, of financing behind that. You know, we'll have a mortgage on the property of $20 million or more. It's a $30 million project. So the likelihood that somebody's not going to pay the special assessment is pretty unlikely because they would lose $30 million of value in that, in that example. So that would be, again, a way to, um, uh, to be able to, to pay for it. I mean, the other advantage, frankly, of doing it this way would be the city's going to borrow the money, uh, which is what they do in a special assessment district. The city borrows the money, but it's at the city's borrowing rate. So it's lower. It's typically more cost effective for the city to borrow the money because you have a better a better borrowing rate than, than if I borrow it. You know, if I finance it, I got to make 7% or 8%. If you finance it, you finance it at 2.5%. So it, it, there, there's a savings there that helps then narrow this financing gap that we're trying to narrow to make the project uh, be more viable and more, more financially feasible. So that's just, that's just one idea of how to, how to deal with that issue. So if the city were to borrow money, would that be under the general obligation bonds? I think that's typically how they do special assessments, but I'm not an expert on that. You know, it goes to the purpose of the bonds sometimes. I think you, you have to look at taxability issues as well. So, you know, if, if it's exclusively for private purpose, those issues come into play. So we haven't gone down that rabbit hole that far yet. So we need to look at that a little further. Okay. Do we have any historical precedent for the city to issue loan to private enterprise? Not that, not that we're aware of as we've talked with staff here recently. And I can't ever remember. I, I don't ever remember. I suppose maybe I should ask you that. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, could, we could recall. The private purpose issue does come into play as to taxability as well. So you, you I think there are instances across the country where that can be described as a public purpose when it is in the form of economic development, but that's something we'd have to engage bond council in to get a determination on, on just what we would be looking at, and we can do that at some point. The, the, the community improvement district statute contemplates that it's, that it's, you know, you don't have to use a general obligation or a uh, a, a bond that's that's um, subject to the full faith and credit, but but there's a discussion in the statute that talks about full faith and credit bond can be used. So the community improvement district statute, which is a state statute, does contemplate that that's how you can finance a project like this. So and and obviously this type of approach, um, not only with respect to the loan request, but also with respect to the parking and the additional parking that we're talking about. We, we could use something, a similar type of approach for that as well. Um, but again, part of the challenge to the, to the project is to the extent that we expand the amount of parking that is being requested, um, then we have to have more participation from the city in how we pay for that. Now, when they did the uh, downtown 2000 uh, project, um, and, and I don't know, Mike, whether you were Commissioner Amos, if you were on the city but there, and the, the commission the then, but uh, when they did that project, uh, th that was originally contemplated that the development that occurred around the project would pay for roughly 50% and that the, uh, the city at large would pay for 50% of that parking garage. That was the original uh, kind of proposal program and then kind of what ended up happening is the project that the private development didn't follow at the same pace as the public development. So the city had gone ahead and built the parking garage mm -hmm. already and the private development didn't follow quite as fast and it frankly didn't get done until we came along. Um, but I mean, by way of example, um, 
the 901 building right now, we pay $180,000 a year in property taxes. So, you know, a big portion of that is going back to the city uh, to help them pay for the parking facility. Now, the same is true. We actually have a tax increment financing district on across the street with the hotel, but a portion of the tax increment financing revenues and the transportation development revenues in that project are earmarked to also help pay for the parking garage at, across the street because that was part of that original downtown 2000 program. So, so I mean, that, that was the original structure that they came up with when they did downtown 2000. So I'm not saying you have to do the same model here, but, but that was the idea when they did that one. So, um, thanks Bill, Mike. Bill, before you go on, I, I think back to Lisa's question and, and Matt's question a little bit. I think the presentation <laughs> you're receiving has some refinements in it that weren't necessarily captured in the previously delivered uh, presentation. So if you find our answers a bit hesitant, that might be the reason for that. Um, I will tell you that the recommendation um, that they're quoting me for was a discussion we had with uh, the developers about a project. Um, in fact, uh, I think Mr. Jackson um, from NDC had uh, worked with us on it back in Iowa City. And if you think about it for a moment, you don't necessarily want a parking district or a parking deck can, you know, that's part of an integral part of a complete building constructed by two separate contractors on a project. You'd want that all built together. And so what my suggestion was is that you look at the idea of a lease with a uh, consummated out with a purchase at some point. Um, but you, and, and my caveat about all of that was you need to make sure that uh, Kansas state law would allow such a thing uh, to occur. But just think about trying to match things up with two different entities. And I think the point they make, and I think it's a valid point, and that's causing some of the consternation, I think, in the discussion, is that if we don't build in parking uh, as a part of, of a project, then the burden to provide parking tends to fall back to the city in terms of providing public space in the downtown. And we have different ordinances as to requirements for parking in the downtown district. So that's why we're having that, that, that conversation. And it's a bit difficult to do that because at some point you cross the line, is this a public obligation to provide this parking or is this a private obligation to provide this parking? And, and then how do you break out the costs associated for all that? So, uh, you know, I think the conversations have been in earnest, but we, we know that there's some gap there that we're really having trouble um, trying to fill um, with financing sources. And then the loan, you know, obviously causes us, uh, you know, to be a bit hesitant um, because that part of it is uh, fairly unique to us. And um, I think Paul made a good point uh, about risk and not wanting to burden the city with risk, or Bill made that comment. And uh, the, the loan agreement as originally proposed um, had the possibility, serious possibility of, of placing some pretty significant risk back on this city. And I would also comment about Bill's comment about special assessments. Um, you know, you've just had some experiences where uh, just because you assess property doesn't always mean that it's going to be uh, paid entirely uh, when it goes to forfeiture or sale uh, through the county. So you have to keep those types of things in mind. Uh, juxtaposed against the comment that they didn't want us to burden any risk. And, and I don't disagree with that, but that's also a situation we had vacant property, where this is improved property, and you've got $30 million in improvements sitting on that property. Which, so there, there's a lot more that's going to get lost if <laughs> those specials don't get paid. There, there's there's going to be a, a first mortgage lender that's going to be real concerned about making sure that those specials are paid. So, I mean, the other, to follow up on his comment as well is, you know, the city, we're in a downtown urban district that does not require any off-street parking. So just like the Pachamama's building, we, didn't, we had seven parking spaces. We have 55 apartments. So, I mean, 
you don't have to build any parking, but you can't have a successful project without the parking. The city doesn't have to build the parking either. Uh, there's nothing that says you have to build the parking as the city, but I mean, we have to have the parking. So we have to figure out, you know, one of those three mechanisms is what we have to look at, how we pay for it. And, and none of them are very attractive. I mean, the issue with parking is, is it doesn't generate any revenue to pay for the, the cost of the parking. So, but we have to have it in order to make these projects successful. Uh, so, you know, we're kind of left with what is kind of the best choice of, of all the alternatives that we have. None of them are very attractive, but probably the tax increment financing district is probably the best mechanism because it shares the burdens of the parking across all the taxing dis districts, which is appropriate because you're building tax base for all the taxing districts. And it also um, uh, doesn't burden other property owners in downtown. You don't have a special assessment that you have to go say, hey, Mike Amix, you own this property over here, you gotta pay a special assessment, even though that parking may or may not really benefit you as a, as a downtown property. That owner. happened kind of so. recently. <laughs> I was say, I mean, one of those that sounds familiar. <laughs> That did happen to him. <laughs> Please go ahead. Bill, one of the reasons that I asked Mike about the same ownership group, it, it, it seems to me, what's the parking requirement on the grocery store if it were to just be a grocery store? Well, if it was a suburban grocery store. No, I, I mean, know. at the site at 700, 700 New Hampshire. Well, I'm not quite sure how to answer your question. It's, what, there's what kind five of parking? parking spaces per thousand square feet is what they like to have. Okay. That's kind of their spaces? minimum. So the they're 200. Yeah. Something like that. Huh? Yeah. So they've, I think they've requested 125 parking spaces is kind of what they view as kind of the minimum they need to make the project successful. And, and between what we have requested and, and, everything that's needed to do it with the apartments above it, it's about 330. You're, you're going to build 337, right? Yeah, and, and part of that 337 is the, the, the spaces are along right. the street. You know, you saw the, uh, the, the, the charts, and I guess I could go back to those, but, um, you know, so it's, it's not just the parking garage. The parking garage would be 267 or something like that, and then you got the surface parking that's just south of the building and then you've got the street parking that's the angled parking along New Hampshire so that's that count includes all of those spaces in that count if that makes okay, sense. Okay so the question that I have is was there ever any consideration given just to build a grocery store at 700 New Hampshire parking in the ground that was necessary to meet the obligation for the grocery store take the additional 72 units and go across the street into the convention center area and add them to that where you have all kinds of possibilities with the tax and finance, everything else that goes along to build that additional parking. I'm not going to say that we thought about that because I, we just haven't had that discussion. I mean, I think the, the original idea was we were down here, we were talking about doing a 20,000 square foot grocery store was the original discussion and we were just going to remodel the existing space and basically the grocery store operator said, you know, this deal would be a lot more successful and a lot more viable and be a lot more workable if it was twice as big. And so that's when we started looking at an expanded footprint. I think having the additional um, uh, rental units uh, helps the project because it helps us allocate the land costs out and in the additional parking, like on 888 New Hampshire, we have 100 parking spaces, but we're paying for that through ad valorem property tax only there's there's basically no sales being generated by 888 new hampshire because there's no the, the only retail business we have in there is a beauty salon and it doesn't generate that much in terms of retail sales so it's all property tax increment but it's enough to pay for the parking for the tenants if that makes sense and so if, if that was the only issue we had was paying for parking for the residential tenants, we could, we could afford that in the project. I mean, our original model, we have a tax increment financing district paying off in 20 years $7 million of cost of the parking garage. So we can, we can afford $7 million without asking you guys to come up with the dime. But when you start going from the number of parking spaces that we originally had in our model to adding now up to 337 spaces, uh, then that's where we that's where we start creating the gap between what we can afford and what the project can afford 
in terms of how much parking the project can afford to pay for. So based on the number of parking spots you originally envisioned before mm -hmm. we came back and said no, it needs to, based on the original uh, number, um, you would not be before us with an incentive. We'd be request. asking for tax increment financing district, but we would, or we wouldn't be asking for anything else. That, that's correct. You have, you have enough revenues over 20 years to pay for $7 million worth of parking. <laughs> and how many spots don't is have that? Space that's a lot, much more than that. That's but what, 200? Yeah, that? it'd be, it'd be uh, 85 on the bottom level and 70 something on the top level of the underground parking garage and then there's 50 on the surface. So, you know, you have to run the numbers there. But the parking garage itself would be about 160. So, you know, and then we used up 72 for the residential tenants, so that leaves you a little bit short of what, uh, we're not that far off of what the grocery store wanted. I mean, we were like four and a half parking spaces per thousand and their kind of goal was five. So we really weren't too far off of what those numbers that the grocery store wanted. Just the issue became uh, when we came and said, hey city, would you please swap us parking spaces for the Hobbs Taylor that's 47 spaces that you're losing that are public parking spaces. And so then, you know, that became part of the issue of how do we replace those then those 47 spaces, you know, and how do we pay for that cost? So that, that all becomes the, the challenge in the, in the math here. Well, I was just wondering what would happen if you were to just look at the grocery store, build a parking below, be able to use the tax increment finance and what it does to all your gap financing that you're gonna have with a model like that and move the remainder of the, with those 72 <coughs> units that you would obviously lose above the grocery store well, and what I would to tell the you site is, next door. Yeah, well, <coughs> I, I haven't run that model. I mean, again, I, 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 I just think thought that, of it, I didn't expect I think the 72 yeah. units will pay for its own parking in terms of it, the ad valorem property tax increment is sufficient to pay for most of the parking costs for those 72 units. So if you move the 72 units out, I don't know that that necessarily, because you're losing then a more, more density. You know, you're losing the fact that you're gonna be able to build, you know, uh, I mean, you already got the land cost anyway. The land cost is sunk in the model. So you know, when you make it smaller, make it less dense, then now you gotta spread, you know, I gotta take all my land costs and allocate it just to the grocery store. I don't get any help at all from the apartments by being able to allocate land costs there. So I, I don't think it helps my model that much, but I'd be happy to run a number for you. Sure, that'd be great. Yeah, I can do that. Any other questions? <coughs> Are you finished with your presentation? I am finished with my presentation, so. Okay, I is will. there another speaker that's gonna be coming up? I think I'm gonna bring uh, Mike back up and I think we're gonna shift over to the conference center now. Okay, well before um, we other... go on to the grocery store or move off of the grocery store, we'll do public comment on just the grocery store and then we can do separate for the conference center. That's which means we're gonna take a five minute break right now. Okay, that's great, thank you.
Something but anyway, big time. neither here nor there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. All right, we're going to come on back. Um, so now we're going to do public comment. We are going to have two sessions of public comment. So if you have something that you want to say about the conference center and something you want to say about the grocery store, well, now will be the time that we will talk about the grocery store. So we'll do the same kind of process when we talk about the conference center. So just the grocery store comment right now would be really good. So come on up and sign in and state your name. And you get three minutes. Come on up. Who's first? Uh, Dan Dannenberg, 2702 University Drive. Uh, it was a mistake to combine the conference center and the grocery store in one meeting like this. That should never have happened. We should be discussing only the grocery store here. The second point is Where's this food desert? I've never seen a map of the food desert. We say there are 24,000 people in it. Where is it? Where are the boundaries? What's the median income of those people in that food desert? We also have the issue of the size of the grocery store. We're told that it can't be less than, I don't know, 40,000 feet. Aldi, out on South Iowa Street, has recently announced plans, if you can believe the local paper, uh, that they're going to expand from 18,000 to 19,000 feet. What's wrong with the existing building that's there? Can't that be adapted to a grocery store? The grocery store does not need to include selling high-end fish bait, um, sandwiches, coffees, whatever, full service cafe. We don't need that. We've got all of that on Massachusetts Street. So we just need a grocery store to meet the needs of this food desert, wherever it is. Also, we're talking about apartments or condos. I once heard somebody use the figure of $600,000 for a condo on New Hampshire Street on the east side there? That can't be right. And to use the term affordable housing is flatly a joke. There is no such thing as affordable housing, particularly when you're charging 600 or I don't know what it is, $1,000 for a uh, uh, condo. The other thing is, we need to know the footprint on the Massachusetts area corridor. How many rental properties are there? How many people live in those rental properties? What are the rents for those? And it just, and, and we need to avoid what I call gopher parking. Dig, 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 dig. We need to have only surface parking because gopher parking is expensive, too expensive. And we know that we, the taxpayer, are going to get, get it stuck in the ear with this sooner or later. And it's a very complex, very com complicated mess, far beyond my capacity to understand. Dan, I just emailed you the food desert map that shows that poverty levels. It's from the Douglas County Health Department and is available on the city website. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Commissioner Herbert. You bet.
Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Commissioners. My name is Ted Boyle, President of the North Lawrence Improvement Association and also a member of the Downtown Grocery Group. And uh, we're going on five years trying to get this grocery store in, uh, at uh, 7th and New Hampshire. Now, uh, you know, the food desert, uh, yeah, the food desert, we got a food desert here and it, it expands from uh, roughly the Turnpike Bridge to uh, around 14th Street, encompasses East Lawrence, Old West Lawrence, and downtown. Now, that, that, that's kind of an embarrassing situation that downtown Lawrence, Kansas, we have this food desert, and roughly 13,500 people are in this particular portion of the food desert. There's other food deserts around Lawrence, uh, smaller food deserts with a grand total of around 25,000 people. But this one in, in, in our midsection, you might say, has around, uh, last count was 13,500 people. Out of that, we've got uh, North Lawrence, 56% 56, 56 below moderate people. East Lawrence, about the same way, Brook Creek and Pinckney. So this store is, is in the heart of uh, the food desert and uh, also the low mod residents of North of Lawrence. And the deal is this grocery store is gonna service all residents, all residents of all income levels. And also downtown, uh, this, will, this will bring a lot more uh, people to downtown. Uh, we haven't had a grocery store downtown since AMP went out on the 1000 block of Massachusetts Street. We haven't had a grocery store in North Lawrence since 1996. So it's, uh, you know, drive two or three miles to the Dillons on 6th Street. But this grocery store uh, is a major, uh, you might say, economic benefit to Lawrence as a whole and downtown. Look at all the uh, restaurants and food service uh, businesses downtown that will use this. So, you know, we've been working on, Downtown Grocery Store Group has been working on this for over five years. And there have been up and downs, up and downs. But when we come before you uh, to kind of present the plan, uh, it, it, it makes me think, well, you know, there's, there's going to be light at the end of the tunnel. And the, uh, the residents of, uh, all residents of Lawrence will benefit off of this grocery store. And, but you know, when it was uh, a 20,000 square foot grocery store and uh, Mr. Barry Queen, price chopper, yeah. came to town. Three minutes, Ted, you gotta wrap it up. See ya. Thanks, Ted. Uh, Mayor, City Council, uh, thanks. My name is Dennis Holsing. Uh, I just have a couple of comments regarding grocery store. Part of the businesses that I own and operate are grocery stores. Uh, it's more of a warning, I guess. Within the grocery store business, there's really four facets of the business that you have is you have the real estate, you have the inventory, you have the equipment, and you have the operating company. Three of the four have lower risk and at least if you go bankrupt or it goes down, there's a value left there. The real estate, there's still a value left with the real estate. Um, operating company, there's not a value put in. This is more of a goodwill. Inventory, even if you have to liquidate it, you get something back out of it. And the last piece is the equipment. Used equipment in the grocery store business brings about 10 to 20 cents on the dollar. So it's more of a warning to you guys. If it's a, if, as a taxpayer myself and a resident of the state of Kansas, um, not in Lawrence, but a resident of the state of Kansas, a warning to People, if you, if you agree to put the money in there and put it as a loan, uh, know that you're only going to get 10 to 20 cents back on a dollar on your business. Thanks. Thank you, Dennis. Any other public comment? <clears throat> Good evening, Mayor and uh, City Commissioners. Bob Shum, been in downtown Lawrence in business since 1970. 
couple, just a couple of quick thoughts about this. First of all, with regards to parking, um, I've worked on many of the lots that we have uh, obtained and put into a special benefit district and it's become long-term and short-term parking available to customers. Uh, my suggestion is whenever you have an opportunity to acquire more parking spaces, acquire the maximum you can and, and do it uh, at every opportunity you can. You, you will limit the growth of Lawrence when you start to limit the number of parking spaces that are available for customers. So just as a rule of thumb, um, we've continued to grow downtown and be very prosperous, but a lot of that has to do with the availability of people being able to come here and park. Uh, I, was, I had a major uh, stake in the last parking garage that we, we put up next to the library and we were able to add an extra 100 spaces through a, a special benefit district financing, Mike, you remember that? Well. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's worked out and it's getting good utilization. So whatever you can do to put together a partnership or an agreement, if the city, city parking service system can participate and you could add net new parking spaces, I think it benefits all of us and, and for sure uh, the, the long term, uh, the longevity of downtown. Second point real quick is uh, the grocery store is the one missing piece, the really, the linchpin of, of rounding out downtown in terms of the 24 hour clock that we've always tried to build with people being on the street for 24 hours. And I don't mean that a grocery store is gonna attract shoppers at three in the morning, but when, when you get to the point where you have a full rounded city, uh, you will have activity on your streets and in your town on a 24 hour clock as opposed to what, when I started it was from nine in the morning till five at night and everybody went home and no one was around. Then the restaurants and the entertainment came and they're now till two in the morning. Uh, we still are just beginning <coughs> now to get to the point where there's living units here in which you create the, fill out to 24 hour clock. It, it's very important for, to achieve the final uh, leg of this with a grocery store. I think it's most important I would hope that there's a way to make this happen. So parking and grocery stores will, will, help, uh, will help downtown a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. My name is KT Welsh. I live at 732 Rhode Island, right across from the proposed grocery store. Um, I worked on the grocery store committee for years. Um, and then the grocery store uh, market shifted with Amazon buying Whole Foods, um, Amazon and Walmart building food fulfillment centers nearby, same day, next day groceries. So Mr. Queen um, is in a real awkward position. The whole market is shifting. And so the five years, he's got to stay open for five years. Um, but if at that point it's not profitable, he can change it to another business, perhaps a boutique grocery store or high end, which will not fulfill the needs of the food desert. And that's my fear. I want a grocery store, but I need, I, we all need an affordable grocery store. Um, I want to make a few notes. Um, I studied the parking study today for the proposed grocery store, 140 pages and fascinating. Um, there's no talk about employee parking, there really hasn't been, and at the grocery store meetings, they said probably people would head north and park in the city parking lot um, between Cable Vision and the Riverfront Mall, which is not enough parking, but I'm just saying that hasn't been included. Um, the consultants in the parking study used 2013 KDOT traffic counts for New Hampshire, Rhode Island, 7th and A Streets. Obviously, this precludes most of the dense development, new track, traffic and parking issues along the east side of downtown, so that is kind of old stuff. Um, they weren't, the consultants weren't informed that Rhode Island from 8th to 7th is one way, except for bicyclists and the people who live on the street. This was a concession we got when they built the Riverfront Mall, so people, that traffic wouldn't dump into the residential street. Um, the 700 block is adamant that that remain one way, if at all possible, because if there is a conference center, that would be even more traffic on our street. 
The traffic study projects out to 2037, but that seems premature because now we're talking about the downtown master plan and a possible conference center. So it almost seems like they'll have to do it again. Um, there was no traffic accident research, and they didn't really say why. Um, just, you remember when Ann Gardner, the editor of Journal World, got hurt so badly on New Hampshire? I was in a wreck three years ago where uh, a car got totaled by a young cell phone user at 7th and New Hampshire. You remember when our downtown mail carrier got hit and hurt badly at 7th and New Hampshire? That's just an example. I thought it was very odd they didn't look into traffic ac accidents in the area. Um, there will need to be a pedestrian crossing at 7th and Rhode Island, especially if employees are expected to go park up there. And um, it's already really hard to cross. Okay, I'll finish up really fast. Wrap it up, KT. Okay. And I know the traffic study is required by the city so they can check that box off, but it just feels like there's so many flaws in it, and I haven't studied it except for one day that perhaps we need to have our traffic engineers study it carefully. Thank you. Thank you, KT. Any other public comment on the grocery store? Okay. Um, I guess it looks like staff might have some comments that they want to make on the grocery store. I can certainly do that. Mayor Diane Stoddard, Assistant City Manager. Um, there are two staff memos and the materials that you have that separately address each of the proposed projects that you have in front of you this evening. I do think that presentation of these two together does really offer the opportunity to look comprehensively at this corridor and um, the specifics of the impact of parking, which is important for both projects, for example. And that sort of approach, the city could look at ensuring that there's adequate public parking at the best um, possible cost and that's the most effective for the area. Um, that's one of the reasons why the staff has been really enthusiastic about the downtown master plan initiative that we talked about earlier. I think that comprehensive view um, is quite important, especially as it relates to our community's most important um, asset, um, our great downtown. So um, I can provide a little bit of comments related to the grocery store project, and then later, if you'd like, we, I can talk a little bit about the conference center um, at the appropriate time. Um, we, uh, we thought that it was appropriate to have the item of the grocery store this evening because in a public format for there to be some discussion about some of the, the discussions between staff and the development team that have been occurring um, in order to make sure that staff is being responsive to overall commission direction um, on this project. We wouldn't want to be somehow going off in a different direction that is not supportive. So to uh, recap on the grocery project, this application was uh, received by the commission and referred to the Public Incentive Review Committee on August the 15th. And since that date, staff and the development <coughs> team and the city's consultants, National Development Council, NDC, that they're represented here this evening by Tom Jackson and Jeff Jewell. They've been working on the details of the proposed project um, and we've been looking both in terms of the review of the incentive request and then also the, the kind of parallel track of it going through the city's development process. So the Historic Resources Commission review um, and site planning as an example. So the, the request has been um, talked about, but just again to quickly recap, um, you have pay-as-you-go financing in the way of a tax increment district, tax increment financing district with the developer that would be fronting the upfront funds for the project. The tax increment financing captures the new property taxes and or sales taxes that are generated by the project um, over the existing base taxes for a 20 year period. So I always think that it's um, a good idea when we're talking about tax increment financing because it can be somewhat of a confusing concept um, to people who may not be familiar with it. So there's a little graphic here that we prepared as I think it's almost best illustrated with this. Um, the existing taxes that are generated is kind of represented by the base. So you have a certain tax value after the project is completed and the increment is kind of shown in red, the difference between the base and then 
what the project generates after completion. So these revenues that are generated would be returned to the developer over time and paid, um, go back to repay certain eligible project costs. And in this case, the developer is requesting 100% of both the property tax increment and the local sales tax increment. So that would be both the city and the county share. Industrial revenue bond financing is also being requested by the developer in order to access a sales tax exemption for the construction materials. And then, as been, has been discussed, a $2.25 million interest-free or low-interest loan for the grocery store equipment was requested. Along with conversion of some of the publicly owned spaces located on the Hobbs Taylor Lofts property to private uses. And the overall economic development policy requires us to do a feasibility study for the project and also a but-for analysis, both of which um, NDC is working on for the city. Um, the but-for analysis attempts to answer the question without the incentives would the project proceed. So city staff, we certainly understand why there is a desire for a grocery store in the downtown area related to the food desert and understand that that would be a good and important project for the downtown community. But we do have several um, concerns with the project as it's been proposed and those are outlined in the staff uh, memo and and basically under several different categories some revenue issues um, um, some part the parking issue and then just a few other issues of note so with regard to the revenue issues um, there's a couple there first is new market tax credits so the project um, as presented uh, would assume a $13.1 million new market tax credit allocation. The developers indicated to us that the project won't proceed without this important revenue source. So the developers recently provided a letter of intent from a bank in Kansas City um, that has an allocation of these credits for an intent to issue between six and $10 million of those new market tax credits. I think it's also important for the developer to provide a letter with regard to the remaining gap credits um, prior to the city creating a development district in this particular case because that's such an important revenue stream for the project. So sales tax increment. Typically sales tax increment on the TIF projects are generally new revenues. So we wanted to make sure that we understood where the revenues were coming from which is why our staff had requested the developer's market analyst, the Dakota Group, that has specialty in the grocery store business, to provide us their analysis of the sales tax that would be generated by this project. And their report indicates that nearly all of the grocery sales that would be generated um, within this project would be a redistribution of existing local grocery store sales. So I think when the city is looking at this project then, there has to be an understanding that the reimbursement of the TIF sales tax increment um, to the developer would then result in an erosion of some of the city and county's existing sales tax dollars and, and placing it toward this project. The, uh, the next item is the $2.25 million. Diane, oh, yes. Vice Mayor has a question. Oh, sorry, yes. Diane, is there any sensitivity on the part of staff to the allocation of the 0.55 increments, given that the voters just allowed us to um, continue with that from April of 2019 to April of 2029 for very specific purposes? Um, <coughs> You it bring up a good question, uh, Vice Mayor. We haven't talked about that before with these projects, but that could be a policy consideration, certainly. It's a good okay. point, Vice Thank Mayor. You. Thank you. So the, on the loan, um, there, there have been some initial discussions um, um, between the developer and the grocer with regard to these loans. The, the developer has alluded to us that there are some payback terms that have been discussed that wouldn't require the payback of the loan until there's certain revenue thresholds that have been met. Um, the city staff was not involved in those initial discussions with the grocer, so we're not exactly sure of all of those 
um, items that have been discussed, but there's a couple of issues with the loan that we would identify. Um, as a, has been previously mentioned, we're not aware that the city's provided a private entity a loan of this amount. And of course, <clears throat> when we operate, we would, if we were to provide such a loan, we would want to make sure that we are very aware of the security of that loan. Um, as mentioned by a previous speaker, one of those issues is the uncertainty with the collateral that might be provided. Um, and if a loan is made for grocery store equipment, what is the value of that grocery store equipment if there's something that happens to the grocery store that the grocery store closes how are we able to recoup that investment if, if at all um, and the city hasn't identified any source of funds to front the loan so that would be another issue i would also like to mention that the city's economic development policy does have some language in it regarding not creating an unfair advantage for one type of business over the other. So while increased land costs and the operating costs um, related to parking requirements and that kind of thing with a downtown location for a grocery store may justify the use of tax increment financing, I think using it for a loan on equipment may be a little bit of a um, a difficult stretch or harder to justify. The developer has suggested that there might be some other ways to um, decrease the gap instead of a loan. Cost sharing on parking was suggested. Um, I think all of these things we would need to understand. At this point, we don't fully understand what the gap is related to the proposed parking and what, um, um, you know, what the developer is needing to fill. The, the CID was a tool that was, um, that was mentioned this evening. Um, <clears throat> we had suggested that that might be a possible thing to look at, but um, we weren't aware that the developer was going to bring that up this evening. But that may be some, a tool to look at. So the parking issues. There's been a lot of discussion both this evening about the parking issues and between staff and the developer um, on the parking matters. So while the downtown zoning doesn't specifically require parking, we do believe that this is a corridor, that there's been some pinch points related to parking. A lot of that's been due to the developer's great work and their successful projects in this corridor um, over the last few years. So we want to make sure that there is adequate public parking um, because we're already aware of some existing needs. And as you all know, we've had some of the existing businesses that have expressed some concerns about that very thing. So in looking at this project directly with regard to parking, we have indicated to the developers that we would need to require the replacement of the existing city-owned spaces that, would be, that are on the Hobbs-Taylor loft site. We can provide some more details about that if you'd like to go into detail. There's information in your packet about that. But we were saying that, that those should be replaced and the city shouldn't have to pay for those twice because we already paid for those in 1997 when that agreement was negotiated. Also, our thought was that the project should cover its own existing demand. So it does appear that the, the latest plans by the development team presented do cover the existing um, demand that are, that's generated by the project and looks at the replacement of these parking spaces like we had had requested, but again, we're still not exactly aware of what the funding, what that does to the funding gap, except for that we know it probably expands it. There's a few other details. Um, there needs to be some more details that would be identified with regard to how the affordable housing units would be managed. Those are things that I think we can address at a later time. And then I just wanted to mention that there is an outstanding lawsuit pending on appeal regarding the Hobbs-Taylor Covenant matter. And we have provided some information. There's been some correspondence by um, some of the people that are involved in that. So just a few concluding comments about the grocery store project for you. I think the full picture of the gap for the project is still not known because of the pending revenue issues and, and then the expense issues and, um, and exactly where the project sits with both of those. So in order to bring this project to the Public Incentive Review Committee, we have those required <coughs> studies that I mentioned. 
and the project has to be solidified in order for those studies to be solidified for it to be able to go to the next step. So staff has been very direct with the developer um, regarding our thoughts about the project in terms of a couple of key issues, the sales tax increment and the equipment loan. And, and our concerns with the use of both of those for this particular project. I think this evening, if the commission has um, any different feedback to the developer team than staff has provided to them, it would be very helpful for the commission to articulate that. Because again, their pro forma is assuming that they receive 100% of the sales tax increment and receive the loan. We also believe that it would be prudent, as I mentioned before, to have those letters of intent related to the new markets tax credits in the amount that matches the amount in their funding request before the establishment of a redevelopment district comes before this body. So, and again, we have a number of people um, here, Tom and Jeff from NDC and other staff members who've been working on this project that I'm sure can address any questions that you may have. Thank you, Diane. Thank any you. questions? That does sound like a prudent list. <laughs> okay. So now we're back to commission discussion. I do want us to be careful that if we discuss any future incentive ideas or anything, it doesn't start to look like some kind of pre-approval by city commission for some kind of idea before PERC sees it. I think we need to be careful of that. Well, I think this, the questions raised by staff or concerns are um, very good. And <clears throat> I would mirror, I would say, disditto on all that, all those items. Um, the idea of loaning money to an entity, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with that quite a bit. <clears throat> I'd just like to say I'm concerned about overriding the voters on the tax increments they just voted on. Um, I, I, I agree with staff, but I just want to say I think that's something we ought to talk about. Because they spoke clearly, and I think we need to respect them. One of my concerns has been that, you know, I think there's a, a really sizable core group in this community that are advocating for a downtown grocery store. And I think a downtown grocery store will absolutely solidify downtown and is, I would agree, a, a missing element. Um, my concern right now is, is over how long we can actually guarantee that this remains a grocery store. You know, I have some real concerns when we look at the market rate rents and we see that, quite frankly, you know, the, the developer tells us that, that, you know, he's losing $9 a square foot by having it be a grocery store. There's certainly a financial incentive to this at some point not being a grocery store. Um, you know, a five-year window is, is great, but if, if we have, if we have a, a store go dark, as they say, and we've got a $2 million loan out there on equipment that's going to get us $0.10 cents on the dollar, what we just heard, that's a huge liability. And the, and the, the second question that, I, that I'd ask, uh, you know, I'm not totally sure ever got answered, the idea that if that store does go dark, uh, where do we fall legally in terms of getting repaid on that loan versus the 20 years worth of rent they owe the landlord? You know, is there an, is, is there an order there? Uh, so I, I have some, you know, I certainly am interested in pursuing the downtown grocery store and looking at, you know, what PERC has to say about the incentives package, but um, the idea of creating some precedent there to offer a, a, a city loan to a private enterprise that is concerning to me for, for not only reasons of business fairness, but just the liability it puts on the city, the risk it puts on the city. So I'd be more interested in looking at other ways to incentivize the creation of a, of a downtown grocery other than a cash loan. Yeah, I don't disagree a, a lot with what Matt has said and what other members of the commission have said. Um, I do uh, appreciate staff's review of all of this. I, I think the staff has done a good job of following the policies that we've put into place and, and, and they've done exactly what I would expect them to uh, be doing. 
I would, um, um, I, and, and I, I say I can't remember a time when then we gave a, a loan to uh, a private company. Uh, there's some that might argue that with uh, the incentive package we have going on at Venture Park where we're giving free land and, and those kind of things, it may be, you know, a similar kind of situation. Uh, and, and we've done things with some uh, public uh, deals like on um, um, uh, the shelter where we uh, brought that loan in-house uh, City Hall here. So, you know, there are some things that I'm going to guess that we probably have done in the past that come to mind now that that could be looked at that way, but but when we're looking at a private business uh, making a, an investment to a private business that might give an advantage over an existing business in town, I think that that's uh, something that uh, could be argued uh, by anybody that is probably something that, that we need to uh, be careful of. But if there is another way to look at it, and I think, I think quite honestly that there is, but I think that we've got to give staff that opportunity to look at the uh, overall picture before this heads to uh, the PERC committee for their uh, review and, um, you know, the recommendation back to the governing body. You know, I want to thank everybody that's been involved in the, um, uh, the committee and, and, and everybody, the developer, of all the work that they've done on trying to uh, satisfy, you know, the needs of the grocery store and, and being able to come up with a plan that, that fills that. And I do think that it is something that, that over time we will have because I do uh, think uh, uh, former Mayor Shum, uh, you know, it is that final piece. I agree 100 percent with that and, and, you know, something that we've looked at for a long time. Uh, so um, uh, I hope we continue to uh, put our heads together and come up with a way that, that it can happen. Uh, it just may not be able to happen quite under the terms that are laid out here. All right. Any further discussion? So now we're going to change gears for the conference center. Let's <coughs> definitely um, keep this, since this is obviously very conceptual that we're looking at, let's not go too long about it. I do ask you about that. <laughs> I'll just provide a short introduction and uh, ask Bill Kruger to come forward. Um, as I mentioned, Bill Kruger is with uh, Convention Sports and Leisure. Uh, they were the consultant that was initially hired by uh, the city. Uh, uh, Bill's come in from, from Chicago. Uh, you know, he, he's really an expert in this area, and I hope that uh, I think you'll find his comments to be beneficial, and I think it's a great opportunity for you to, to interact with him with what questions that you have. So, Bill. Thank you, Paul. Well, good evening, Madam Mayor, uh, Commissioners. It's great to be back in Lawrence. Uh, Bill Kruger from CSL International. Uh, we're headquartered in Minneapolis. I office out of Chicago, and we've got an um, office in Dallas. Um, I'm literally coming back through town. I was in uh, Topeka last night, and we were making a presentation to Shawnee County on uh, the latest study results with regard to the expansion of the Expo Center in uh, Topeka. And so we, we kind of unveiled that yesterday, and I was uh, lucky enough to be able to be coming back through town and extend my stay one day. So um, I don't have any formal presentation. Um, I did uh, the study for the city uh, a few years ago, and um, I'd be happy to answer any questions or offer any insight about industry best practices or you know uh, any recollections about uh, the study that we performed a few years ago. Um, you know, I've, I've worked on over the years, been, been involved with uh, probably close to four, four or five hundred different studies of convention and conference centers and other event facility projects around the country of a variety of different sizes in lots of different states around the country. Um, and so it's great to be back in Lawrence. And, um, you know, we were struck when we did the study of, uh, a few years ago in Lawrence. You know, one thing that every community is looking for when they're, when they're discussing the possibility of a conference center project is what makes, you know, the thing that I always look for is what makes your community unique? What do you have to offer, you know, to draw in what a conference center is really intended to do, which is draw in visitors and uh, increase spending in the community and hotel room nights and net new tax dollars generated by virtue of tourism and visitation. And so um, you know, we're always looking for what's unique about your town that can make it something that's not any town USA like a lot of, lot of other places. So, you know, the, the, the first thing um, that we noticed was, of course, Massachusetts Street. And um, I've done lots of projects in lots of other places around the country, and I've 
rarely come across an asset like that in terms of the density of visitor amenities uh, that are very attractive to a, to a traveler. And so um, initially our study did not involve a specific site uh, when we did it a few years ago. It was really let's look uh, anywhere within the city and let's uh, first measure demand. Is there a market for this type of project? Uh, and if so, let's model the size. Let's, what's the market supportable size of that project? Let's run numbers in terms of cost to build, cost to run, uh, economic impacts, uh, how to pay for it, what types of models might make the most sense, whether it's a publicly led effort or a public-private partnership or a private-led effort. We looked at all those different situations. We looked at different sites. And ultimately, it was pretty clear from the, very, from the, the get-go that Massachusetts Street is really the magnet. You know, if you're a traveler coming in for a conference or a meeting or a visit that Wanting to be near that is, makes a lot of sense. If you think, around, think about around the country, where are convention centers located? If you're one of the biggest cities in the country, you know, or if you're a large city like Kansas City or any of the ones bigger than that or even smaller than that, convention products are located downtown. Um, in smaller cities, oftentimes they're not located in downtowns, potentially because there's not a critical mass of a central business district. Um, but most importantly, um, they're not located downtown because there's not hotel product to support them. Um, the things that make downtowns um, attractive, assuming you have the right type of hotel product to support that conference center, is clearly the density, the visitor friendly, the pedestrian friendly walking environment of things to do before and after you know, a, a conference or a meeting or a convention. And so, um, you know, uh, Lawrence already has all that in place. There's lots of places around the country that are trying to duplicate that sense of a, a visitor district too. So, you know, th that's what really kind of drew us to the downtown location, part particularly trying to tie in Massachusetts Street. Um, in our study, we outlined, um, I believe, two different scenarios a few years ago. One was a standalone convention product that would be publicly led in terms of funding and either operated by the city or operated uh, under contract by a third-party private management company. The second model was a public-private partnership where you'd involve yourself with a hotel investor, developer, operator, and they would actually be um, operating under contract the conference space. In Lawrence, uh, the conclusion really was is that there is a market, a market demand that's not met right now in the community for a conference center product and the, frankly, the public-private partnership concept with a hotel partner um, would probably be the best fit. And, and so we outlined a product and as, you know, I haven't really, you know, I'm not engaged with the, with the, with the team that's kind of uh, leading the, the proposed development that's, that we've been talking about today, but I've seen some of their um, proposal and, and much of that corresponds and is consistent with what we recommended under our scenario two. Uh, a few years ago. Those, that's really my, my comments that I had about our study. I'm happy, happy to answer any questions or if you want to poke, poke my brain a little bit. Yeah, on, on the study you did a number of years ago, it talked about the, whether or not there would be a demand within our community based upon existing uh, convention center space. And I think at the time it talked about uh, Holodome, which is, is now <coughs> Doubletree, having 8,000 square feet of convention space. Mm -hmm. But as I understand it, that number is actually closer to 20,000. Um, can you speak? Can you speak to this? So, can you I mean, repeat what he, we need to have you at the microphone? First of all, we have to decide who we're questioning. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm basically okay. asking, you know, if we'll the, have you up later so you can come to the microphone. Thank you. I, I guess when you talk about the demand for a convention center within the community and base it around a study that talks about 8,000 square feet currently existing and that number being actually double that. I wonder how that changes um, the result of your study. Well, uh, I, I don't know the exact, you know, I haven't seen the, the latest from the Doubletree. And, you know, the, my first comment would be the fact that you have, you have branded, um, rebranded from a Holiday Inn to a Doubletree frankly helps. I mean, a Doubletree is a more appropriate convention conference meeting product marketable brand than Holiday Inn. I think that the renovation that, that they undertook is, is probably great. I don't know exactly what their current configuration is with square footage. The way that we look at it is a couple things. One is, 
is what is the largest contiguous room and does that room meet current standards in the industry from a best practices standpoint? If you're a ballroom or a multi-purpose room, is it subdividable? Does it have a 20 to 25 foot tall ceiling? Um, and then do you have breakout meeting space in correct proportion? Um, you know, the one thing that we noticed about the Doubletree is um, it, it doesn't leverage to the extent that a project down on Massachusetts Street does Massachusetts Street and, and the walkable, uh, walkability of that and that, that particular asset that frankly a lot of people are going to be drawn to Lawrence, uh, to pick Lawrence in the first place. Um, so in terms of location, uh, the, the location is, is better, but that being said, you know, certainly I'm not an advocate of simply investing in something that's going to do nothing more than shift around business that you're already getting. You know, certainly, uh, you know, I would suggest maybe taking another look at that and then, you know, I'd be happy yet without charge to, to, to kind of go back and, and revisit that, look back at our survey data, match up with what the current product is with the Doubletree and match it up with what our survey recommendations were from three years ago and see if anything has changed from an opinion standpoint. And I can, you know, just, um, I could send out a, a memo or an email or if, if you'd be happy for, for that. Kind yeah, of I was just asking, you know, because what's being um, contemplated here, I think is 25,000 square feet, is that right? On the convention space. And, and you know, the difference 25,000 to 8,000 is, is significant. Uh, but the difference 25,000, if what we currently have is 20,000, I think is, is a little different in terms of creating a demand where, where, or creating a supply where there doesn't exist. So that, that's why I asked that question, just to check on that, sure. that make sure the data that was used in the survey was actually accurate to begin with. Right. So. Would you care to comment on Manhattan's declining numbers? Sure. Um, Manhattan's declining numbers. Now, when you look at the numbers, and, and, and this, this does not involve me going back and, and interviewing them within the last month, you know, but this is based on the study results from JLL. You know, JLL is not a competitor that we deal with quite a bit at all in the industry in terms of uh, other types of uh, competitors of ours in terms of feasibility studies. So that being said, I'm not overly familiar with how they do their research and how they run their analysis and how they project their numbers. When I looked at one chart that was just shown to me, when I'm looking at the numbers and you look at the number, I think it was mentioned before by one of the commissioners about the total attendance number of 30,000 or 40,000 and how does that, why, you know, what, why is ours so much larger at 100,000 that we projected? Now, it may be apples and oranges and it very likely is. You know, our 100,000, number one, is attendee days. When I model that and I project that in there, those are attendee days, meaning if you're in town for a three-day conference, you are as one individual, you're one individual that uh, some consultants will count that as one. And in our case, when we're trying to extrapolate to economic impact and the impact in the community and on the building operations, you count that three-day visit and that one person has three attendee days. So there may be a difference in there. If they were using just attendance versus attendee days, there could be a disconnect. So for instance, if they had, if they had 10,000 non-local attendants, the attendee day number for a three, assuming everybody was there for a three-day event would be 30,000 the impact. Does that make sense? A, a 30,000 attendee days. So, you know, without getting too much into the, the details with that, that's, that's one of the differences. The other difference is if you look at the, the total decline, it's not that much from the first year. I mean, it's, it's not that significant in terms of total attendance the way that they measured it at least. And I don't know enough about the detail of that situation to really comment on what's happening there. I can tell you that what we found in our survey, and we surveyed, you know, uh, I believe more than 100 meeting planners, state, regional, local, non-local um, meeting planners of, of conventions, conferences, or trade shows, and meetings. We distinctly heard, you know, demand levels and interest levels uh, that were quite significant um, for Lawrence relative to all these other hundreds of studies that we've done in similar markets. I'm not saying it's at the highest, but it's, it certainly was above average, and we show that in our report document. The one thing that we heard from those meeting planners, too, when they're talking about where are they currently hosting their events throughout the state, let's just say you're a state group, you know, what we did here is, here is Lawrence is so much closer and not as remote as Manhattan um, to greater population. If you're coming from, you know, the east side of the state or the greater Kansas City marketplace, it's much more convenient. And you even get some of that in Topeka. You know, as a part of our Topeka Expo Center study, we did talk to some meeting planners there. 
And in their particular case, we actually recommended not to expand their meeting space in Topeka because there wasn't enough demand to warrant that. We said focus on your brand and you'd go more with the dirt animal events, the livestock equestrian kind of events, but don't expand your meeting space. You know? And in your case, you've got such a distinct brand, both with KU and with Massachusetts Street and the proximity to the greater metro area, that to me, you've got a very distinct destination from Manhattan. Uh, that's much more r remotely located. And then you also have a bigger project. Your project is bigger right now than Manhattan's. Manhattan's biggest problem um, from a facility standpoint is the fact that it's very deficient in breakout meeting space. It's got one single room about the size of what our proposed project would be. And it's subdividable, but they've only got 1,000 or 2,000 square feet of breakout meeting space. And so we've heard from lots of meeting planners that that the lack of breakout meeting space is a big deficiency there. So what hap has to happen is you take that big room, you have to start subdividing it for their breakout needs while the other space is set up for the general assembly or a food function or an exhibit. So, so you've, got, you've got some challenges where it doesn't really operate as quite as big as that biggest room is. So your project would be a little bit bigger and more distinct. Does that answer your question? Any other questions? Yeah, I have one. Given your knowledge across the board of, of working with conferences, are, do you find the percentages higher of communities being a partner in it, or is it mostly private developers? Uh, well, it, would you, okay. the trend definitely is with P3s and public-private partnerships. It's absolutely that's growing in, in, in prevalence around the country. In a lot of cases when we do studies, if I'm doing a study for a community the size of Lawrence or smaller, oftentimes what will happen is even if there's demand, unmet demand that would, would suggest a product would be viable, you start running the cost benefits and the numbers, particularly on the cost side. You say, okay, you've got a facility that may cost uh, 20 or $30 million uh, that's going to lose a couple hundred thousand dollars per year in operations. You've got to have a capital reserve. Uh, uh, fund set up to to pay for future repairs. You've got some additional marketing dollars, and before you know it, you've got this annual cost number, a uh, bonded number, and an annual obligation number that's pretty large. That's a non-starter for a lot of communities. So instead of uh, biting off and chewing a thirty million dollar project themselves, if you're, you know, from a public sector standpoint, oftentimes you'll try to figure out a way and what is the carrot that's required to incentivize a private partner to come in, in this case a hotel developer or investor, to build the hotel and to build the, the size conference center or at least as close to it as you, as, as, as you need in your community. And oftentimes what that means is you've got an oversized conference product relative to the hotel that's attached to it. But given the fact that the hotel already has staff overhead, it's already got an operation in place. Usually if you're a full service hotel, you already have an in-house food and beverage, you already have an in-house group marketing business and a group sales business. You've got all these things that makes it much more efficient for them to run that space as opposed to contracting it out to a third party that doesn't have a hotel interest or to have the city run it themselves. So oftentimes the calculation is really, do we do it all ourselves and, and build it next to a uh, hotel that already exists? and then run it and then have this annual operating deficit that we've got to deal with in addition to debt service? Or do we figure out what the incentive is to get the private partner and get the type of product that we're really looking for? And my advice to a lot of communities is if you're going to go down that road, you know, most of our clients are public sector. So when we're advising them, we would say if you're going down the road of a public-private partnership, first understand if there's demand. So it would require kind of you know, uh, someone, whether it's us or somebody else, to, to update the market to see if, you know, the, the double tree is, if there's something different fundamentally with that or the marketplace. But then also figure out what the incentive really is and to make sure that the interests of the city and the public sector are protected. Their dollar that's, that's invested, however that shape or form, is protected. And a lot of times the development agreement, the management agreement, the room block agreement has to be, have the appropriate type of guidance to protect the city if you're going to go down the road of a public-private partnership because ultimately if they build this thing, even if the city owns it and you got it attached to the hotel and the whole hotel is running it, I've seen a lot of cases where there's not enough guidance built into that development or management agreement where over time what happens is the hotel starts to run it like their own space, you know, w w without really that, that, that particular focus on the guidance that the city can provide by virtue of having that written into an agreement. I don't know if that answered your question. I kind of went off on a 
a wild tangent on that, but I'm, I'm saying that the trend really is public-private, and more and more communities are looking for ways to, to involve the private sector to creating that solution as opposed to building it themselves. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Uh, Bill, when you look at, or when you send us your report back and you take into consideration, we received a letter from uh, the university um, back in July of this year. And it was talking about uh, they're not able to participate at this time because of their priorities. Uh, the Lawrence campus, uh, specifically central district that they've been um, building. But it says with the construction of the new Burge Union present, uh, university needs for conference space will be met. Will that be uh, taken into consideration? I'm not contracted by anybody right now, so I'd be happy to go back and look at that. And, and all, those th all those metrics are relevant. When you get to the end game, you I guess you, I heard the word free. I, I <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll fresh it up a little bit, but, okay. but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I, I don't have enough hours in the day to really, to really plug into a lot of additional analysis, but I'd be happy to do it um, in terms of, you know, um, just uh, taking one other observational look at what's kind of changed over the last three, a few years and just offering a, a comment. Be happy to do that. You know, I'll, I, I, maybe I'll just say one last thing. Um, you know, there's been some discussion about other types of public-private partnerships and and how these, you know, those case studies are going to be consistent or uh, similar to our situation. They come in all makes and makes and models, and they're all different sizes. They're all structured differently, and they all have different local market dynamics and and visitor attraction assets and infrastructure. You know, so when you look at a project like in Coralville, Iowa, where you've got a a hotel conference center that's talked about a lot in the industry and and other areas, and someone's smiling like they, they've heard this before. <laughs> but but hey, when you when you talk about this, this, this your purview. <laughs> <laughs> but, but when you talk about that project, it's, it's, a great, it's a great project, great asset, but it's one of those uh, uh, scenarios or models that have, that have been done around the country that you end up with a great product, but the way to get that done is to actually have the public sector take the lead in both things, the conference center and the hotel. So for instance, that's a 280 room Marriott, um, and ultimately, does the city still own that hotel? The city still owns the hotel, so the city financed it and 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 owns the hotel um, and the conference center as well. So it's a larger hotel, it's a full service, it's very expensive, it's in a different chain scale of a hotel property than we're probably talking about. So so it's not really apples apples to apples when you're thinking about that case study relative to what we might do. So I just want to throw that out there that there's always lots of comparisons, but you really have to dig into you know, all the nuance of how each one of those are set up and what the products are. I think that's a very accurate statement. I would say that's a very unique model that I would not wish to replicate. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds very complicated. <laughs> but it's interesting, if, if you think about Overland Park, Overland Park is the same model where, well, a, a little bit different in terms of who actually is contracted to manage the convention center, but Overland Park, what they said is, we want a big convention center, we're gonna drop it down in a suburban area right off the interstate, it doesn't have the same density of visitor-friendly stuff that you would find in a core bigger city downtown. So it's tapping into different types of markets. But in order to right-size a hotel asset that's a headquarter hotel to the size convention center they wanted to build, they couldn't get enough private sector develop, uh, investor interest in building a 500-room you know, full-service hotel. At, you know, there's just not enough return on investment to even make it um, you know, possible by virtue of a massive incentive. So what they ended up doing is financing via Texas and financing and owning the, the, uh, the Sheraton Hotel that's attached to it. So that's, that's another public-public type of model. I got one last, I think. Um, how do you see online meetings affecting this industry? You know, online meetings and um, internet and technology, you know, I've been doing this for 22 years. Um, the company's been around for 25 years. And going way back to when I started, back in, you know, 94, 95, that was talked about back then too. You know, technology, satellite, you know, uh, you know meetings and, and, and tying in people with the technology and things like that. I've seen very little evidence that the core fundamental purpose of a this is an example, a state association or a regional association or a national association 
or a trade show group who is a organization that's established around a membership base that disseminates information that gets people together from a dispersed geographic region, whether it's a state or a region of states or a country or international. There's no, there's no replacing pressing the flesh and meeting people face to face. So there's always going to be the core business. The real question becomes is, is there going to be more of a fragmentation by more of these public private partnership models popping up? More hotels getting even more sophisticated with their group space and their meeting space that they offer within their hotel products. And more corporations building their own in-house space to do some of that stuff. So, so there is a fragmentation, but, but it's, it's been an old adage that has really held true since I've started at least, is <coughs> there's always a need to meet and the most successful, attractive, strongest destinations will always win out versus all the other people who are trying to play. You know, and so if you think about what your strength is, you go back to what makes our destination stronger or different than everybody else. And it comes back to the university and it comes back to Massachusetts Street, in, in my opinion. It's hard not to think that this just seems like an arms race between communities mm -hmm. nearby for the yep. newest and, and best. And yep. so it kind of feels like we're just chasing a trend, mm -hmm. which when you're chasing a trend, you're on the wrong end of it, obviously, mm -hmm. if you're chasing it. So that's kind of where my concerns stem from. What other communities nearby have built one or plan on? You talked about Topeka mm -hmm. expanding one. Can you do me a favor? Sure. We say Topeka. What? Not Topeka. Topeka. <laughs> As someone from Topeka. I'm sorry. It's, that's been very weird to listen to. I'm God sorry. bless you. Thank okay. you for going there and helping I'm, with I'm, them I'm with that. I'm from Minnesota originally. We always pronounce that weird. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> so, um, I mean, you, you talked about Topeka. So what are the other ones I see, you know, in, in the booklet here, which I guess is, is a competitor to you that they talk about Lenexa and mm -hmm. Embassy Suites, Olathe, mm -hmm. of course, Manhattan's working on. I mean, how, how is this not just joining an arms race, basically? Yeah, and that's, that's a very fair point. You know, there's, there's lots of, you know, a lot of detractors of investment in convention and hospitality and tourism products around the country, I'll, re I'll go back to that. Mm -hmm. and, and again, I don't dispute that, that there is been a ramping up over the last decade or two of investment and interest in those kind of projects. Um, however, you know, this particular project, for one, I think has such a great foundation in, in location and a great foundation in a private partner who's willing to, you're able to leverage private dollars to create the pro end product to a much greater degree than you would in a lot of places. If you are, if you are, um, you know, any of these communities that I've been working with, you know, I've, I did a study in Wichita, did a study in Wyandotte County uh, with regard to Village West and some event facility products there a couple years ago. Um, we did a project in Salina. Um, you know, that's just Kansas. And, you know, we did um, work in Kansas City, Missouri, and just, you know, uh, on the convention center and the arena, and, you know, we, we did a lot of that initial planning work and study of, of those particular projects. And that's just Kansas and Missouri. You know, we've done lots of, uh, lots of other projects around the country. So the fact that we're employed and there's a lot of communities that are hiring us to do stuff does, does support what you're saying, that there is mm -hmm. certainly an arms race out there. What we have seen, though, is, it, again, go, going back to the best way to leverage private dollars and start with a foundation of a very strong destination. And in any kind of free market society, those went out, you know, in, ter in terms of those kind of projects. So I, I think that this particular project here um, does certainly, you know, fall into what you're trying to do when you've got an asset like Massachusetts Street, which is depending on traffic. And the intent would be to leverage those assets to drive more traffic into the into your community with people spending money and staying in hotels and generating tax dollars through visitation and tourism and travel. You know, that's what the best destinations do. Again, we get talked a lot about this on the grocery store side of the equation, live, work, play, you know. The play part and the work part is convention hotel product. And without having the assets where you have hotels, attractions, nightlife, bars, restaurants, things to do in a compact area, if you're missing a couple of those pieces, you're not a complete destination. And the hotel and the conference center can be an important part of that. Um, 
again, if it doesn't make sense for the city, it doesn't make sense for the city to invest in that. Because, you know, I'll be the first to say that, 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 that the property along Massachusetts Street, I'm sure there's a lot of great ideas for what could happen there. Um, you know, and a conference center and a hotel oftentimes, you know, you have to look at that very closely to make, to, to see if that makes the most sense to tying up critical property that's got a, on a frontage of, of, a, of a street like, like Massachusetts Street. I think that this plan, the way that it's kind of set up where you've got the hotel, which is the marketable asset with the tower that you're trying to get people in front of those windows staring at all the activity along Massachusetts Street and is a very marketable frontage. And then you've got the conference and the meeting space tucked right behind it, and then you've got parking, and then you've got the grocery, and then you're all lined up with the bars and restaurants. And, and, and to me, that's just kind of a win-win in terms of all the pieces that you're trying to look for when you're thinking about a place like this. When you were talking about the public-private partnerships, I would imagine that a lot of these conference centers in the arms race that they're competing with each other, they have to update on a regular basis. Do you see future updates to a conference center as another public-private partnership, or is that just entirely privately done? It's, it all depends on the situation. So for instance, um, I'm, I'm writing up right now, and I'm going to deliver it tomorrow, which is a draft of a development agreement in Muskegon, Michigan, of all places. And so they've got an existing Holiday Inn that a part of this public-private deal is they're rebranding the Holiday Inn to Doubletree. And then they're going to be, or uh, yeah, double tree. And then they're going to be, um, the co the county's going to be building a conference center and attaching it to the hotel. So in that case, the county is just like this proposed in this case is going to own the convention center asset. But but as a part of that development deal and the management deal and uh, of the conference space, the hotel is going to be running that space. But as a part of that deal, you want to make sure that you uh, you account for how our future capital repairs and improvements are going to be taken care of. And in their particular case, since they own the conference center project, this is going to be a sharing. The hotel is going to pay half, and then the county is going to pay half for future repairs. So it's going into a capital reserve replacement fund that's, that's, that's set up separately from, an, from a uh, debt service fund. So is that a new fund, or is that one that was kind of original with the, comp the beginning conference center, the base conference center, you might say? Yeah, or do well, you do you know that? Well, the hotel exists, and so mm -hmm. now they're going to renovate and rebrand, mm -hmm. and the convention center will be brand new and hooked up to it. So the convention center is new. The convention center is for new your example. in that particular project. I understand right. now. Thank you. Right. I think that was all of my questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Bill. Yeah, thank you. Come on up, Paul. I will be very brief, and I know we've had a we've had a lengthy discussion uh, this evening, and I appreciate everybody's patience. Uh, but I think these are very important discussions because we're talking about uh, two projects uh, that are going to have a substantial effect on downtown, and, and we believe a very positive uh, effect on downtown. Um, Commissioner Amix, I just wanted to, you ask a question. I think about the university's uh, support and reference that letter. Uh, uh, you know, I, I will say I think the university has had a subsequent conversation about that. Uh, as we all know, there's a new chancellor, and uh, and I think the the new chancellor uh, has had an opportunity to digest uh, what is happening here and and the message that we got from them, and and they uh, said to me that we are welcome to share, is that they're they're interested. And, and they want want to be a part of the, of the discussion here, uh, so I just wanted to point that point that out. You know, in uh, in real estate. I gotta ask Paul. I gotta ask Paul. Yeah. So when they say that they're interested, does that mean they just want to use the space, or they want to financially participate in the creation of it? Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. I think that's a that's a question that uh, you know, the, if they come to the are invited to the table and come to the table that uh, that we can have with them. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, I mean, they have not said to us that we have dollars that we want to put into this. And, and I wouldn't anticipate that, uh, but I don't want to speak for the university. Thank you that. for clarifying that. Uh, you know, in, in, in real estate, we all know the old uh, saying of location, location, location. And what differs uh, Lawrence from a lot of these different projects here is, is uh, we have something that 
lot of these places just don't have, and that is the, the ability to walk out of the hotel that you are staying in or the place where you're having your meeting, and you walk out onto what I think is the best main street and the, the best downtown around. And, you know, Olathe can build their conference center and Lenexa can build their conference centers, but they just don't have that. Um, you know, I've been out to the Doubletree, and I think it's great what they've done there. I hope that they succeed. I know they're not going to be wild about this, but um, they don't have a situation where people can walk out of the front of that uh, hotel and, and experience what they experience here. And, uh, because of that location, uh, we have an opportunity to realize uh, an economic impact for the community uh, that most places uh, just simply don't have. Uh, you know, I'm a lawyer and I go to the Kansas Bar Association annual meetings occasionally, which rotated between Topeka, Wichita, and Overland Park uh, forever and ever and ever. And when I was on the board, we had to deal with the fact that annual meeting attendance was declining and we asked members why and they really just weren't interested in those locations all that much and this year the Bar Association did something different they decided to go to Manhattan and the president of the Bar Association this year is Steve Six uh, who many of you know lives here in Lawrence and I had a conversation with Steve about Manhattan and he said it was great it's the best annual meeting we've had in years people loved it because of the ability to just go out around downtown Manhattan. He said, we need to do this in Lawrence so that we can bring the Kansas Bar Convention to Lawrence. Uh, those are the opportunities that I think we, we have here. And, you know, we're, as I said before, we're not asking you to commit to anything. We're, we're just asking you to, to, to engage in the dialogue with us about uh, we focused a lot on the conference center, but this is a big redevelopment project. It's the gateway into our city if you're coming in from uh, North Lawrence. And uh, it's something that's going to have an imprint on, on this city for a long time to come. And, you know, we all can see the places in our community where big things happened and we wish that we would have done them differently. Um, this is one of these things that I think we, we want to make sure that we get right. And we have an opportunity to do something that has a really great public benefit. And that's why we, you know, we want to be your partner in this and we want to uh, engage in the dialogue. There's so many good questions that have been asked and, um, you know, there's a lot more study that has to happen here. Um, I mean, you ought to hire Bill Kruger or you ought to hire somebody else like Bill Kruger to come answer a lot of these uh, questions. Uh, these studies will work just like everything else. Uh, you hire them, we pay for them. Uh, you ought to go to Manhattan, and you ought to talk to Lyle Butler and, and uh, get more information about what's going on there, and, and maybe there are other projects that have happened. Uh, but, uh, you know, we just want to continue the dialogue here, and we hope that uh, uh, after tonight you'll say, you know, this is interesting. Uh, this is going to be something that's big, project for our community and uh, we want to make sure we want to be part of making sure that we get it right so thank you for your time tonight thank you Paul and Paul just uh, Paul in response to um, uh, the comments that you made I bring the letter up because I look at the university as being a major player in what our conference center would be and when I see a letter like this from Mr. Modig that talks about you know at present uh, you know with the develop uh, development of the new Birds Union you know, their needs for conference space are being met. You know, I'm a little bit concerned as to the effect it might have on our public investment that we would be looking at in, in a new conference center downtown. So if you can get another letter or a change of direction from this letter, that would be extremely helpful. Yes, be happy okay. to do so. Thank you. Okay, shall we go to public comment? Okay, so it's time for public comment. Uh, sign in and state your name and there's a lot of people my goodness routine oh, okay <laughs> so, so you guys are just gonna start fighting for it <laughs> no. we're with serve on the downtown Lawrence board I'm Emily Peterson I'm Cody Bates and I'm Morgan Fellers um, we're also all business owners on Massachusetts Street um, we have a little I'm not gonna remember everything um, hello commissioners we are glad uh, to be here tonight to take part in the discussion of, a bu of building a conference center in downtown Lawrence. 
As members of the DLI board, it is our responsibility to preserve, protect, and promote downtown Lawrence to ensure it continues to be a diverse and bustling destination for locals and visitors. We see the conference center as a key part in supporting our mission. Having a conference center in downtown Lawrence will help three, in three key areas to promote the health and stability of our historic downtown. The first, to provide critical Sunday through Thursday business that all of our hotels and local businesses, restaurants, right, retail and services need and depend upon to remain stable and successful and in many cases grow. Uh, two, to stay relevant and competitive as a community. According to the 2017 um, Lost Business Report compiled by Explore Lawrence, Lawrence has lost over 1.5 million of business in the last year and a half due to a lack of hotel rooms and meeting space. This business is going to other Kansas communities, Overland Park, Topeka, Manhattan. And three, increased revenue for hotels, retail, restaurants, and service businesses in turn supports our city's general fund and our community. Uh, examples being increased sales tax collected goes to our general fund, increased liquor tax collected helps our local nonprofit agencies, increased transient guest tax supports more marketing and business development for Lawrence as a business and tourist destination. In addition to these key points, there are many other benefits we are continuing to explore, including increased parking and increased residential density, which is good for all types of business, retail, restaurant, personal, and professional services. We are here to support the commission in continuing to explore this critical development for our downtown community. Thank you. Thank you. Is that from DLI or just E3? It is. Yep. Okay. It's from no, DLI. We represent it's, the board together. Yes. Okay. Is there is that attached to the agenda at all? Because certainly we need to. We haven't to have sent it as a like letter. That. This is yeah. just a statement we prepared for today. Okay. We'll, we'll definitely send in yeah. a letter then and get it attached to any future agendas because that's really helpful to have. Yeah. yeah. No problem. Thank you. Absolutely. Right. Thank you. <clears throat> Dan Dannenberg, 2702 University Drive. Uh, boy, lawyers and consultants really know how to suck the oxygen out of the room and chew up time. I guess that's because they get paid by the hour. Uh, will this conference center uh, get us closer to having a good modern police facility? Will it get us closer to having a transit hub that we can use for upcoming years, decades? I don't know. Maybe it does. Maybe it doesn't. Uh, so far, I, I don't know. We don't even know. Public partner, public-private partnership? You know who gets the shaft in that deal. The public. So I don't think we need to be uh, going at this with a lot of, uh, shall we say, alacrity. Secondly, we have a sports palace, we have a Orient Hotel, we have the HERE project, uh, we have the situation involving the pilfering of city water by the uh, Jayhawk development out, off of Bob Billings Parkway. Uh, three of those projects uh, involve the, the same developer and the HERE project, they were from Chicago. Uh, quite frankly, I don't have any trust in the city to do a project like this with any integrity or protection of the community at large. I'm just a simple taxpayer. And I just don't see how we benefit from this. If you want to do something about downtown Lawrence, clean it up. Remove the trash, remove the dead leaves, find some program or facility where the beggars and transients can go and spend their time. Maybe uh, recruit them into a what used to be the CCC back in the 1930s, but our governments don't think that way anymore. We're so backward that we're, all we think about is these big, you know, projects. And finally, it was very unresponsible to have the grocery store and the uh, conference center on the same agenda tonight. Here it is. It's almost 8.55. That means we've been here for more than three hours. 
So I think we need to have a, a, a little um, gut check here. And oh, one other point. Please speak into the microphone. If, you, if you're afraid of the microphone, then leave the commission. But please speak in so we can hear you. Thank you, Dan. Uh, okay, so once again, Dennis Holsing. Um, I am from Topeka, so I know how to pronounce that. Uh, <laughs> you're up on a farm. I mean, Bill did a great job, but I just, <laughs> just winced every time I heard it. <laughs> you're up on a farm outside of Topeka, so I, I, I hope that can um, constitute. So the first, I want to make sure you guys understand. Uh, I appreciate the time, but I'll start out with the fact that the fact that somebody pointed out that it, making things, the job is not to make, to give a taxpayer to make an unfair advantage. If, if you can do this and make it a fair advantage and put it up for an RFP, God bless you because I want to be part of it. So if you guys decide you want one, all I'm saying is include me. I'm a Kansas-based company. Uh, after growing up on a farm right now, I own 30 companies based in Kansas. All the corporate office, everything is based in Kansas. I own the Doubletree Hotel in Lawrence. I spent more money renovating it than I paid for that hotel. It does have 20,000 square feet. It is divisible. The study, I guess my point is this, that I have never with any one of my 30 companies ever asked for or received a dollar from any government in any city that I've ever been in. I don't believe in competing that way. And if they can build it, and you guys build it with personal private money, God bless you, take me on. But if you put it out, and you're gonna build something, and you're gonna put it on Mass Street, I wanna be part of it. I can get the financing. If you wanna put it on, on put together what that is. And if you wanna have it include a grocery store, I know I'm not supposed to talk about that, but the grocery stores I have our natural foods grocery stores. That, that, that sounds a hell of a lot better than a price chopper on Mass Street. It kind of fits in with Mass Street. This is a beautiful community. You guys are very fortunate to have what you have here, but I'm saying if something gets built, put it and make it equal com competition for anybody that comes in. The studies that were presented, I don't believe are worth what's being presented because once again it still has us listed as an old holodome many 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 millions of dollars a year early, earlier so outdated studies uh, it, it has this 8,000 square feet it's 20,000 square feet it's got 408 parking spots if you're gonna my daddy always said he goes don't build a church for Easter Sunday and that's what I think we're doing here we're talking about a church for Easter Sunday because the incremental business that's going to come here is not a hundred thousand I own a hotel in Manhattan when they built that convention center, they needed it because there was not other hotels in the facility, in the area. And now there is. That, and it is on room nights or overnight. As it is not based upon stays. I can give you all the facts on Manhattan as well because I own no hotel there. But once again, and I know I've already taken up my time, but in summary, I'd say is this, is I'm not opposed to it if it's private money. I'm not opposed to it if you do an RFP and you make it and you put it on equal ground and keep the money in Kansas. Because if I do, if I am successful, and we make the money, it's gonna stay here in the state. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. I'll just sign in after this because we're short on time. Um, my name is Nick Kuzmiak. I just moved here about three weeks ago. Um, so that's basically your preface for why this is gonna sound a little bit naive. So. My concern is not of the convention center itself. I think it's pretty cool to have a convention center here, and I think it will bring a lot of interesting business and especially benefit the low, I guess, spending at retail establishments during the week and kind of make it a little bit more steady throughout the week. That seems pretty cool to me. What I guess I'd be more concerned about is that the current LJ World building is not necessarily an eyesore, but kind of just a wall. Um, it's a huge block of nothing in between a whole bunch of awesome stuff and City Hall, and there's nothing in between. It's just a wall. So, and waxman candles. But, um, so a convention center, as cool as they can be architecturally, they're still kind of walls, basically. There's usually just a couple of entrances. It's only for convention attendees. There's not really much interaction with the general populace. 
Um, so, you know, there's an opportunity to here to change what is currently a wall on that street, make it a little bit more interesting, and kind of integrate it into the current, more granular environment that we have in downtown Lawrence. Um, which leads me to a, kind of an open question, and I don't know if this has already been covered, I guess I'm new here, but that huge Riverfront Plaza Town Center Mall thing, just a couple of steps away from there, seems to be for sale, and is about 100,000 square feet at least. That seems like a pretty good place for a conference center, um, especially because it's not exactly going to be in the middle of anything. It's, you know, it's still very, very close to downtown, so it gets all the benefits that these guys are talking about, getting people to an interesting destination. But it wouldn't also be a wall in an otherwise very interesting quarter. So um, just a thought, and, you know, and feel free to discard that if it's already been talked about, but you know, something to think into, maybe. No, we appreciate new perspectives. Yeah. And someone that talks about the elephant in the room. Nick, can you give us a little bit of information about your background? Um, I'm an environmental engineer by training. Um, I used to work for Big Oil, so I'm a very corporate person. Um, urbanism is more of a hobby for me at this point. Okay. And I'm from the D.C. area. I lived in uh, Philadelphia, and this is my first small town I've ever lived in, so sorry, okay. small city. What brought you, <laughs> Not what that brought small. you here? What brought you here? <laughs> my wife is a um, hometown Lawrence person, as, oh. and all of her family lives here. She got a job, and I decided to quit and follow, so I'm... So I'm was from Houston very recently, and I'm loving it here compared to, <laughs> compared to Houston. This Welcome great. to Lawrence, Nick. Thank you. We Thank need you to get you coming. a Jayhawk sweatshirt. <laughs> I'm, I got to get one soon. This is wrong. <laughs> Thank you, Nick. Good evening. Hayden Maples. I live in the Deerfield area and have a just really one line of questioning. I don't know much about conference center, conference center construction, but I was curious after the discussion on public funds versus public private partnerships, if private was possible, sounds like it is, that would be my way to go. Thanks. Thank you, Hayden. KT Welch again. Um, oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta have my notes. Um, Briefly, I just wanted to bring up the fact that um, there are two universities in Kansas, I mean in Lawrence, Haskell, Indian Nations University, and KU, and always seems like we forget Haskell, and I bet they'd be interested in the conference center too, even though they don't have the deep pockets. And in the county, we have Baker University. So I think it would be smart to include all three when we're doing research. I also had a question for City Manager Marcus. Um, which I guess I have to look at you and ask him the question according to the rules, but um, a few weeks ago when he announced that um, this would be on a future agenda um, and it would be mainly looking at incentives, he also mentioned that they, the trainer firm would be showing a partial conference center plan because it was too big a project to show the whole plan. So since it took a year since the mayor requested that they come down and show this, to the public and the commission. I think it would be really great if we could find out tonight if this is phase one and what's the footprint for phase two and does it include the Reuters building and the Riverfront Mall, which I agree with Nick, you know, we should use that mall for something. Thank you. Thank you. Tom, do you know if this is just phase one? Should I be asking Paul this, Bill, someone? <laughs> Come on up. Are there future phases? No, this is the, this is the whole thing. Uh, and so uh, there, there, are, there are no future phases. Thank you, Paul. Any other public comment? That's good because my hand hurts. It's hard to keep up sometimes. All right, so now we go to staff. Just a few uh, very brief comments, Mayor. Um, as uh, Mr. Kruger mentioned, it's quite typical for conference centers to have some amount of public participation in some form, and therefore, um, it's also quite typical for these conference center projects to come out of some kind of a public planning process and be an identified community goal. 
um, so we provided a, a memo to the commission that summarized the public participation in four of the conference centers that are fairly well known in our region. So that being the Overland Park Center, the Olathe Conference Center, Lenexa, and then also Manhattan. In all cases, the public sector was involved in those projects with financing and planning, and the development of the conference center was an identified goal from the elected leadership. So I would note that while um, the subject was broached during the city strategic planning discussions earlier this year, it wasn't identified as a key initiative for the strategic plan. So while um, a project like this could fit in certainly to the critical success factors that, that the city commission identified in that strategic plan, I think it would need to be taken into context with the other initiatives and the other projects that the city has on the, on the plate and looking at reprioritizing if that would be of interest. Hey, Diane. Yes. Just to clarify, we actually did float the idea when we had the big board yes. the conference center and it, it was not selected. So I don't want people to think that it wasn't chosen as one of our big priorities by absence of its discussion, I yes. guess I might say. Correct, Mayor. Thank you. Um, so such a project like this really requires a lot of staff hours. It requires a lot of dedicated commission hours to look at that. Um, so Manhattan's been talked about this evening. Um, I happened to serve as the deputy city manager during the time when the conference center there was planned. So I'm aware that that project was part of a larger redevelopment effort in the city that came out of a larger master plan that had some community buy-in and also um, had a basis in strong community consensus, consensus that was lasting because projects like that oftentimes span over a couple of city commissions from the time that, that the, the idea is generated to the time that the conference center is actually constructed. So I can certainly attest to the amount of hours that it takes and the dedication that it takes to do a project like this. Um, with regard to this particular proposal, we asked Gary Anderson uh, with Gilmore and Bell, the city's bond council, to provide um, a brief memo that's included in your packet. So in that memo, he identifies a variety of just issues and topics, some of which have been talked about that I think are good to keep in mind that I think the city would need to consider if it were uh, looking at a, a public-private partnership of this, um, uh, of this sort. Um, I would also note that there have been some preliminary discussions with uh, some developers that had proposed a development on the existing Reuter site that city staff has talked to recently. Um, and I mention that because the Reuter site and the parking that's surrounding the Reuter site is on the trainer map. So I think that that also maybe feeds into the concept of looking at this whole thing in a holistic fashion as to what all is happening in the corridor, what are the public participation with any of these projects, and, and of course the public parking. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Brian? So based on that, would you um, recommend that this all get wrapped up with our master plan for downtown? I think it could certainly feed in and be an issue of discussion with that. Um, I think the opportunity to have that kind of discussion is right at the cusp. That's one of the reasons why we wanted to give you an update on that initiative that you all had set um, and some time frame about it. Um, it could also be something that you say, this is what we want. It just, I think it needs to have very strong support at the governing body level for the community to undertake a project like this. You know, planning and projects submitted by private developers are not always in sync. And so um, the sequence is out of step because, you know, to be um, sequenced in a way that would fit into a comprehensive plan, we'd be underway with a comprehensive plan. People would be coming out from the public encouraging us to look at different projects and hopefully, probably hopefully from the 
proposed uh, developer's concept, they would be talking about a conference center <coughs> and uh, how desirable that would be or wouldn't be in the downtown or some project that everybody seemed to gravitate around. And, and so that's why we linked these things together. You note that Scott got up to begin with, he talked about the master plan for the downtown. That was a part of the strategic plan. And while the conference center was brought up, I would remind everybody that there was a discussion as well about, well, then we don't, we, you know, we're not gonna address projects that are not completely within the strategic plan. And the reality is, you know, opportunities present themselves for lots of reasons, and that doesn't mean you don't take a look at them while those things are going on. But I think uh, Diane's report is critical from the standpoint that all of these other conference centers that she mentioned started with a lot of um, community support, that the idea generated came from a, 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 some level of planning in those communities where it was as much community driven as it was private sector developer driven. You have to have both to make it work unless you're gonna do you know, a total public project and um, I don't think anybody around here is advocating for that at this point. So I think it's, you know, it's how all of these thing, things fit together, but you know, we did have that discussion. We did bring it up. Where do you stand on this idea of a conference center? And I think the other issue that maybe KT was referring to my comments, I'm gonna to have to go back and look at those comments, was more the scalability of what this would be. I talked about, you know, we got into kind of a, a back and forth about, is this a convention center? Is this a conference center? What's the difference? What's the scalability? How many rooms or uh, space does this really make sense for in Lawrence? in this location, what other uses might fit in better. And I thought our newest residents' comments um, about urbanism were right on target. And, and the advantage, of course, we have with, with Mike Trainer, I think he understands urbanism and the building uh, inhabitants interacting with the people on the street. And, and that's right, there's a big gap right now you know, from City Hall uh, going south along that street. There's no point of interest for the public to keep walking that way. And in the downtown, you want people moving constantly and having that energy come from the building and having the energy come from the street back into the building. And that's missing in that area, and that's something that I'm pretty confident trainers group would, would know enough how to make that interaction work despite what the use is on the inside. So when do we make that statement about uh, uh, where we are in this process? Do we need to be making that now? Do we need to be making it after the master plan's done? At what point do we say we're on board or not? I think it's helpful if you have any comments this evening for us and for the development team. To me, big picture, this, this seems to be is this a redevelopment project or is it a conference center? Because I have some very specific <coughs> ideas when I hear conference center. If we're just talking about, if we were to redevelop the LJ World property, what would we do? That's a completely different framing of the subject that, I mean, I would sit here and say we could build, you know, residential space. We could have affordable housing. We could do this. We could do that. We could put a grocery store on the bottom. I don't know. You know, I mean, I think that we need to come at it from that angle instead of from the angle that we're coming up. I guess my feedback would, would be that, I, you know, I have interest in anything that, that brings people downtown and into our community, certainly. Um, and, and I guess kind of a, a moment of irony, I, I was actually slightly more interested in the project prior to the information the project team handed us tonight where we look at Manhattan and, and the Manhattan numbers actually scare me quite a bit. Uh, they don't seem to align at all with our projections. You know, when we look at the projections and we see 100,000 people coming to our community, but then we look at Manhattan, which is told to us to be a comp, and they're nowhere near that. Unless, I mean, as the consultant talked about, if you count one person as three people, if they're there three days, 
perhaps you, you, you approach that. But, uh, and, you know, and then the comment was made, well, there, we haven't seen a, a major drop off, but I mean, statistically, there, there's a 27% reduction from year one to year four at the Manhattan Conference Center. I mean, that's 27% is, is to me a significant drop off. And perhaps that's indicative that the honeymoon phase is over and, and maybe that's leveling out where we can, we can expect it. Uh, but looking at those numbers, I, I have some, some real concerns about um, the ability for us to sustain a conference center. And my biggest fear is that we will create a conference center that the city will be required to feed in perpetuity. And I want to make sure, I'm gonna, I, I mean, I'm going to need to see some data that suggests that we're not going to have to feed this thing in perpetuity without real benefit. Uh, and the Manhattan numbers don't leave me incredibly confident. Well, I do think one of the things that we have is in the discussion, it, it, it may be that once in a lifetime or once in this generation to be able to do something to, to this kind of magnitude in downtown. Mayor, and I, and I do appreciate your comments about, uh, you know, if it's a redevelopment project, what all can be in and, and, and what we should be looking at as, uh, as being an investor in the project. I do think that we have one thing here is that we have, you know, a developer and owner who's assembled the property. And, you know, it, it, it's one of the things that seems to me that that might be one of the hardest things for a governing body to be able to do without using its, its power. But in this particular case, you have one that's able to do it. I did like uh, uh, Dennis uh, Holsing's uh, comments about the idea of an RFP, uh, you know, and, and those potentials that can happen here uh, if, if we are going to be uh, that kind of investor and how we are going to invest and be able to take care of the concerns that uh, Commissioner Herbert has uh, in, in, in those numbers there and, and put that on somebody else. Uh, but I do, think, I do think that one of the things that we have is I think that we have to take that next step and be able to get that information and be able to uh, see if this can go together. And then you make the decision on whether or not you don't participate in it at that point. I think this is that once in this generation time to be able to look at something like this and allow it to go by, I think is simply wrong. It's once in a hundred years, well, have a be. piece of property that big. I won't be here then. <laughs> Are you sure? I guarantee you. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I don't want my comments to be misconstrued. No, 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 I'm a, no. I'm, you know, like I said, I'm, you know, I'm, th this is very important to me. You, yeah. uh, you know, I serve on the TGT board. I'm a, right. I'm, Anything we can do to, to advertise downtown and bring people downtown, I, I hold it the highest regard. I, I just want to make sure that the numbers are there. And, and I, you know, when I looked at that study from three years ago that talked about, well, all you have now is 8,000 square feet. I mean, that's just, it's just simply not a true statement. It's just factually inaccurate. And, and if we're going to use data to use our judge, to, to make our judgment, we need to be looking at data that is accurate. And 8,000 square feet in your community is, is so far from accurate that to me it's, it's misleading. We need to look at data that is accurate and that talks about the present conditions of our community. Well, I stop and think as time's gone by, and Scott can correct me on a number of the things that we've looked at. I think when I first became a commissioner, we had somewhere in the neighborhood between 500 and 600,000 square feet uh, of, of total space in downtown that was available for rent, and today it's got a it's in excess of a million, I'm going to guess, or somewhere up in there. It's incredible numbers. So as we've seen this evolution of downtown continue to happen, it has happened in such a way that, that there has been a public-private partnership throughout this entire uh, development that we've seen. We've got, we've got a downtown that, you know, that we are all very proud of and, and the fact that uh, it has developed in such a way that uh, has made uh, a lot of the businesses uh, that are there today uh, successful because it all works together and you know parking is a problem uh, but you know it's not a bad problem it is over the next couple of weeks as it should be but uh, uh, the truth of the matter is that we've seen a change as we look to the future and one of the things that happens is is that uh, uh, I appreciate the comments from the DLI board and, and, and you know the uh, comments that they have there because Let's, let's face it, they're a major investor in downtown with not only their uh, dollars, but their time and the commitment that they've made, as, as many of us are. But we've seen this change in downtown, you know, where it's gone from being that major retail group and the government center and service center in, in the community, and, and, you know, to being, you know, maybe at times more of an entertainment center today. And it's probably going to continue to do that, especially as we look at if we're going to add a conference center, it's probably going to put that push 
uh, for more entertainment in downtown also. So, uh, you know, retail and, and those kind of services are going to be uh, looked at other different ways possibly. But, uh, you know, here again, I think that this is an awfully big project and, and one that we can't, uh, you know, at least not look to uh, if, it, if the possibility can happen. So I, I think... Uh, I think we remain and stay the course and, and look and see what we can do. Yeah, I agree. We just need to continue the discussion. Um, <clears throat> I think having a conference center downtown would be a very good asset for Lawrence. I'm very intrigued by Mr. Holstein's comments regarding an RFP. I would like to know more about that. Um, but this is, would definitely be, I think, a positive for downtown. How we do it, it needs to continue with that discussion. I appreciate uh, Mr. Olsen's investment in our community. Um, I was fortunate to, to be at the ribbon cutting for the reopening of the Doubletree, and um, I really do appreciate that investment. I also appreciate the investment that the folks have been making downtown, uh, and our city's made some investments downtown, so it's, it's very important to us. But I would hope that staff has adequate direction from the commission this evening about continuing discussions and uh, and continuing to move forward with this downtown planning project that we are kicking off in January because I think that will help our citizens with context for all the questions that we're looking at and I think that's a critical piece of this is having the engagement of the, the citizens and um, you know that process so thank you yeah as Diane mentioned community cons consensus would be important as it spans across several commissions is there anything else that um, we would like to add to this discussion before we unofficially adjourn okay so can meeting I have, is can oh I, no, can I have one more? <laughs> before, no, before we leave, if I could just for a second, um, I, I just want to make a comment about uh, uh, we had three individuals uh, uh, from the city family uh, who had passed away this weekend, and from the commission uh, to uh, the families of Ray Urbanic and Vera Mercer and, and Leonard Monroe. I want to pass along uh, from, for all of us uh, the, our deepest sympathies to those families that had a whole lot of, uh, you got three people here that put a whole lot of years in here and um, uh, something that they, they uh, you know, made a big impression on my little life. So, um, you know, I am uh, pretty important. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, Mike. Mike for Here we go. We're over now. Thanks, Mike. I'll let you know.